Rest Stop Revulsion, from Johnny Marker 666. I still have nightmares. This happened to me on March 12, 2015. I was a truck driver making my way through the country, delivering goods. Sometimes my routes would take me to secluded highways with rest stops in the middle of nowhere. On that day, I had been driving for hours, and my eyelids felt heavy, making it hard to focus on the road ahead. My family always warned me about driving tired, but I needed this job to support them. To clear my head and stretch my legs, I pulled into a rest stop. Out of the cab, I lit a cigarette and took a deep drag, inhaling the nicotine that flooded my system. A light drizzle descended, dampening my clothes but providing an oddly calming feeling as I paced back and forth. I was not alone at this rest stop. An old couple sat in their car, chatting animatedly while enjoying some takeout food. A father played catch with his son near one of the picnic tables. On the other side of the rest stop were some old brick bathrooms, separated by gender and standing side by side, a typical sight at these stops. I decided to use the restroom before continuing on my journey. As soon as I entered, an unnerving sensation crept through me like ice on my skin. It looked normal, the usual grimy upkeep, but nothing that would normally alarm me. I entered one of the stalls, and when I shut the door and locked it, something felt off. It wasn't just that the lock was broken, allowing for a slight gap. There was something sinister happening in that restroom. My instincts screamed at me to get out of there as quickly as possible. For once in my life, I decided to listen. Once outside again, I threw away what was left of my cigarette and looked around the still innocently bustling rest stop. Nothing seemed out of place. I decided to call my wife and let her know I was safe and on schedule. She told me to drive safely and reminded me of my children waiting at home for me. As I hung up, I heard a scream, one that chilled me to the bone. I saw people scattering from their cars, abandoning their activities, and fleeing from something unseen. My gaze quickly shifted to the restroom entrance, terror clawing at my mind. The old man had tried to visit the restroom before they left. He now lay near the entrance, blood pooling around his handle stumps, which flailed uselessly at his sides like two pale, malformed snakes. Every muscle in my body urged me to run back to my truck and flee this hellish scene, but as though on autopilot, like a real-life horror movie, I found myself approaching the gut-wrenching sight before me. From a distance, I could make out marks scrawled on the door jam in fresh blood. They weren't any words or symbols, just haphazard lines that seemed as tortured as the man who had presumably created them. I took several steps toward him, trying to make sense of what just happened, until I stopped dead in my tracks, remembering I wasn't alone. Someone or something with a twisted hunger for cruelty had captured us both in its sinister web. Hatred burned within me. Whoever did this needed to be stopped, or else more innocent lives would be caught in this nightmare of bloodshed. Another scream tore through the air, an anguished cry shattered by agony as a figure flew across my vision from behind a bush near the entrance. It wasn't human. No ordinary person could have such distorted limbs. And its face, what looked like wet clay smeared across its grotesque visage with no discernible features, simultaneously beckoned and repelled all attempts at understanding its motives. The thing was back inside the restroom, prowling through its lair, littered with mutilated victims. My legs trembled, but I knew fleeing was not an option. It would hunt me down and subject me to the same horrors as these poor souls. My determination steeled, 
and I locked eyes with the creature, an empty stare that somehow communicated malice and malevolence. It began moving towards me, leaving the old man's wife, now similarly dismembered, crumpled at its feet. I ran towards the entrance of the restroom, determined to stop this creature from hurting any more innocent people. But as I got closer, I noticed it was gone. It vanished without a trace. The old man and his wife were still there, mutilated and lifeless on the ground. Panicked, I decided it was time to call for help. My hands shook as I dialed the emergency number and gave them the gruesome details of what had happened. They told me to stay put, and that help was on its way. Concerned for the safety of others at the rest stop, I tried warning everyone to stay away from the restroom. Some listened, but others dismissed my warnings as some kind of sick joke. Frustrated and scared, I waited for the police to arrive. When the authorities showed up, they quickly cordoned off the area around the restroom and began their investigation. They interviewed me about what had happened and who or what was responsible. I don't know what it was, I told them honestly while staring at the blood-stained door jam. But we have to stop it before it kills anyone else. They took my statement seriously and asked me to stay nearby in case they needed more information. The other people at the rest stop seemed terrified now that the reality of the situation had sunk in. Soon after scanning my surroundings for any potential danger, another officer approached me and began asking questions about my wife and children. It took longer than expected until, finally, we reached a sudden realization. I knew who this thing was, or rather, who they were. With horror filling my heart, I told him about a group of faceless people both my wife and I vaguely knew from our town. They were notorious for their disturbing behavior, but nobody could ever pin anything substantial on them. Every item I mentioned matched their signature characteristics. As we discussed this new information further at an alarming rate, we heard the wailing sounds of more sirens approaching. Before the police were able to apprehend them, the faceless ones retreated, preventing their darkness from being captured. Chills ran down my spine as I recalled what happened in those brief moments. I had managed to survive an encounter with the faceless people, but their killings remained a gruesome, unsolved mystery. The restroom massacre stayed imprinted on my mind, but for now, at least, the chaos had momentarily ceased. The authorities continued to investigate and did everything within their power to find these faceless human beings responsible for such atrocities. And although I knew they would stop at nothing to catch them eventually, it was impossible not to fear that one day I might cross paths with this malevolent group again. Cracked Window Revenge from Anonymous User 098 Life was pretty uneventful before this happened to me on June 1st, 2014. I had a dull desk job at an insurance company, living alone in Bakersfield, California. Boredom was my best friend, and life's gray routine chewed relentlessly on my sanity. My flaws would sometimes come out to play in my free time. For example, my occasional smoking habit to pass the hours. That night, I was coming back from a miserable day at work when I saw it, the cracked window of my small apartment. Chills ran down my spine as I imagined the worst. Someone had broken in. Carefully, I called the police and explained the situation before cautiously approaching the door. As they arrived, we searched the place but found nothing stolen or out of place. They concluded it was just an accident or act of vandalism, nothing more. Feeling consoled by their reassurance, 
I thanked them and closed the door behind them as they left. After a few days and no further incidents, life started to return to its predominant monotony. But one evening, when walking back from work, I stumbled upon a stranger murmuring to themselves aloud in a dark alleyway nearby, raving on about missing belongings and the horrifying aspect of their faceless tormentor. Curiosity peaked. I listened closely to their vivid description of this, faceless, figure responsible for their troubles without ever revealing himself. Intriguing? Yes, but ultimately unrelated to my situation, or so I thought. However, unwittingly that night, I signed myself up for a terrifying series of events that would change everything. The following week was uneventful until an anonymous envelope appeared on my doorstep with no return address, just blood-curdling fingerprints and frightening messages scrawled all over it. Upon opening it up, I discovered a blood-stained shirt with menacing suggestions that the perpetrator wanted this bizarre memento returned. Uneasy and unable to process this horrifying discovery, I went to work, feeling a lingering sense of menace. Over lunch, I confided in my coworker, Jackie, who had been a close friend since we started working together, about the unsettling incidents. She was equally disturbed and mentioned how she had heard similar tales from others around town. Tired of being a victim, I decided to contact the people in the alleyway that night. During our meeting, we confronted the harrowing truth. The faceless person seemed to be targeting each of us with uniquely terrifying acts of violence or grotesque defacement. For weeks... We endured this torment until it took an even darker turn. My closest ally in our newfound group, Samuel, disappeared without a trace. The remaining victims and I frantically searched for him, ever vigilant for the faceless entity stalking us. I couldn't help but dig deeper to figure out who might be responsible for the grisly events unfolding in our small group. Desperate for answers, I tried to connect the dots, discovering patterns behind the torment. The targeted people seemed to have no apparent links, either geographic nor professional. Fear gripped us all, yet we refused to let this faceless terror control our lives. We discussed our findings and decided to set a trap for the mysterious figure. We staged a public gathering hoping to draw the tormentor's attention inadvertently. We didn't inform the authorities, thinking they might not believe us or attribute these events to mere paranoia. One by one, we strategically took positions throughout the area. Our ploy seemed futile until something happened that night during our watch. An acute scuffle erupted nearby. By the time I arrived at the site... I found one of our group members, Sarah, unconscious on the floor. The tormentor had attacked again but managed to slip past us unnoticed. We tended to Sarah and helped her regain consciousness. Although she was physically harmed, her determination remained intact. She described how her attacker grabbed her from behind and viciously assaulted her before our arrival startled him into retreat. With each passing day, the horror intensified. The attacks grew more gruesome. Crude mutilations left some of our members too injured to cry for help. Yet we trudged on in our quest for justice, tireless and resolute despite facing an unseen and terrifying adversary. At last, a critical break came when another member discovered security footage, grainy and indistinct but essentially revealing vital information about the perpetrator's appearance. The figure wore an outfit that lacked distinguishing features, entirely nondescript yet chilling to witness in person. Discussing it with each other, we realized that this detail should have been glaringly obvious sooner somehow rendered cruelly invisible by what felt like a devious trick of the mind. We had finally uncovered the mystery of our faceless foe, 
This terror was the work of an organized group of faceless humans bent on tormenting us through careful and intricate planning. Killer on Campus, from John Smith 387 I never thought something like this could ever happen in my sleepy college town. This happened to me on December 4, 2017. My name is John Smith, a third-year college student studying computer science at a small-town university in Ohio. I'm your average young adult. I love listening to music gaming with my friends, and binge-watching shows on Netflix. But my life took an unexpected turn one chilly winter evening. I was staying late at the campus library, working on a group project with my friends Sarah and Mike. We'd nearly finished our research when Sarah suddenly excused herself for a bathroom break. The library was nearly empty, so Mike and I decided we deserved a brief break. As we sipped our lukewarm coffees from the same old paper cups the library had used forever, we chuckled over some of Sarah's attempts to lighten up with quirky jokes earlier. It wasn't long before Mike checked his phone and realized we'd been waiting for over twenty minutes. Should we go check if she's okay? he asked. Concerned for our friend, and eager to finish our project, we headed toward the bathrooms to find her. As soon as we rounded the corner, we noticed something awry. A sinister red liquid smeared across the floor leading into the women's bathroom. I called out as quietly as possible, hoping that it wasn't Sarah's blood. Sarah? Are you there? There was no response but only an uneasy silence. We cautiously entered the dimly lit bathroom and spotted Sarah hunched over against the wall. Her wide-eyed fear cut straight through us like a shard of ice. Although not visibly injured, she looked like she'd seen the most terrifying thing in her life. Guys, there's someone. She choked out before motioning, poorly hidden behind a bathroom stall door. Our eyes met, and we knew we had to act before the mysterious person was upon us. The pungent, coppery smell of blood choked the air making each breath feel like swallowing razor blades. As we inched towards the stall door, Sarah mouthed a barely audible warning. There's more than one. We exchanged worried glances but continued to press forward. We had to protect her. Mike and I flung the stall door open and revealed whatever horror lay within. It wasn't just one faceless person. We faced an entire group of them, each horrifyingly identical with not a single facial feature. Frozen with dread, our minds struggled to comprehend what we were seeing. How could these beings even exist? There was no time to ponder as they suddenly leaped at us, their long limbs swinging wildly. The chaos that ensued was unbearable. Mike and I tried to hold them off using everything from our heavy backpacks to nearby garbage cans as weapons. But they were relentless, scratching at our faces and clawing at our bodies with lightning speed. It didn't matter how much we fought back, they just kept coming. The deafening sound of bone-splitting strikes filled the small bathroom as every swing or jab connected with those faceless beings that swarmed us like a drove of ferocious hornets. Blood stained our clothes, sweat slipped into fresh injuries that turned every flinch into absolute agony. Sarah screamed for help at the top of her lungs over the cacophony of chaos that surrounded us. But no one came. The library had been virtually empty when we ventured here in search of relief from our project woes. We had never expected a nightmare like this, a living hell for which there seemed no escape. And yet, it was real. Too real. As we fought off the relentless beings, I looked for an opportunity to grab Sarah and escape. 
I spotted a janitor's closet nearby, and it was our best chance to hide. Get in there! I yelled to Sarah, motioning towards the janitor's closet. She got up and limped towards the door. She tried opening it, but it was locked. She looked back at us in panic. Mike hurled a broken trash can lid at one of the creatures, stunning it momentarily. He managed to grab its keychain from its belt and toss it to Sarah, who caught it clumsily. Fumbling, she tried each key until she found the correct one and opened the closet door. We quickly retreated into the dark space, slamming the door shut behind us. We huddled in the darkness, trying to catch our breath while listening for any sign of the faceless beings outside. Mike searched the closet and found a walkie-talkie. We were unsure whether calling for help would attract unwanted attention from our attackers, but we couldn't risk being stranded here. I turned on the walkie-talkie, praying that someone would hear our desperate pleas for assistance. Hello? Can anyone hear us? We're trapped in the library's bathroom and being attacked. We need help urgently. My voice shook as I spoke into the device. Silence greeted us for a moment before there was a crackling noise, followed by a deep voice responding. This is campus security. Hang tight, we're on our way. We stayed silent, waiting anxiously for help to arrive. Sarah leaned against me, shivering with fear and cold sweat dripping down her face. Minutes felt like hours as we clutched each other tightly in that dark closet. Finally, we heard pounding footsteps approaching, accompanied by authoritative voices giving commands. Relieved cries followed as campus security forced their way into the bathroom. Mike cautiously cracked the closet door open, peering to see if it was safe to come out. They got him, he whispered, relief evident in his voice. They're arresting the attackers. We emerged from the closet and saw several uniformed officers restraining the faceless beings, who had stopped fighting back. They seemed almost lifeless now, like deflated balloons that had been drained of air or substance. An officer approached us, concern etched on his face. Are you guys okay? He asked, checking us for injuries. We're fine. I managed to say through my fear and exhaustion. The officer looked reassured and herded us out of the bathroom to safety. Several days later, we read in the news that the faceless attackers were part of a criminal cult that had been terrorizing local college campuses with gruesome attacks for weeks. These individuals had undergone extreme surgical alterations to remove all facial features as part of their initiation into the cult. The local authorities thanked us for our assistance in apprehending these dangerous criminals and shedding light on the bizarre case. It was difficult to shake off that harrowing experience, but we did our best to move on. School resumed as usual, and our project sat neglected as we focused on healing our emotional wounds from that night in the library bathroom. We never heard any more about those faceless assailants after their arrests, and could only hope they wouldn't resurface again but there were times when we couldn't escape wondering if there were more members of this disturbing cult still lurking in our city, waiting for their next unsuspecting victims. Nameless Fear from Sam Bennett I thought my life was normal and mundane, just like everyone else's. This happened to me on the 12th of October, 1997. The skies were heavy with gray clouds as I walked out of my small two-bedroom apartment in Chicago, heading to another unexciting day at my job as an insurance claims adjuster. I worked in the city center. My family, a loving wife and two beautiful daughters, 
made all my efforts worthwhile. The days were long and tedious, filled with paperwork and endless phone conversations resolving disputes between clients. My annoying habit of biting nails had become an inside joke at work. My co-workers often teased me about it, and I couldn't help but laugh along with them despite efforts to stop the compulsive nibbling. My best friend, Evan, even bought me a gag gift, a homemade concoction supposed to deter nail-biting through its foul taste. Of course, it wasn't effective. One chilly evening, after finishing work late and missing dinner with my family, I decided to grab some fast food on the way home. A light drizzle had started when I exited the office building. The rain dampened my already sour mood. I entered the fast food joint and placed my order, exchanging small talk with the cashier while waiting for my meal. With food in hand, I stepped out into the downpour, cursing under my breath when I realized Evan hadn't returned my umbrella last weekend when he borrowed it. In haste to escape the rain, I chose a poorly lit alleyway as a shortcut home. Suddenly sensing something odd, I noticed traces of what seemed like fresh red paint splatters all over the brick walls. The unpleasant metallic smell wafting through the narrow passage caused me to gag slightly as I hurried on. Reaching the end of the alleyway felt like getting out of a crushing chokehold. Catching my breath, I saw an older woman walking her dog nearby. The curious animal ran past its owner, sniffing and growling near the entrance of the very same alleyway I had left moments ago. Abruptly, the dog yelped and sprinted back to the woman, fur raised and tail between its legs. I shook my head, jumping when a hand lightly grasped my shoulder. It was Evan, smirking with amusement as he mocked my shocked expression. What were you doing in that creepy alley? And what's with the terrified face? Evan asked, teasing me as we continued walking. I told him about the paint and how even the dog seemed scared by it. He laughed it off as a prank by some local kids trying to creep people out. As the weeks went on, strange incidents started becoming more frequent, pets disappearing, unsettling sightings reported by panicked residents, and vandalized properties increasing each day. The culprit always seemed one step ahead of the police leaving behind gruesome displays on their victims' remains. People whispered apprehensively in hushed tones, wondering when this chaos would end. Yet amidst this hysteria, I couldn't escape the feeling that I was being watched. A cold dread clawed at my subconscious whenever I dared step foot near another dimly lit area. One evening after work, my colleagues decided to unwind with some drinks at a nearby bar. We joked and chatted away for hours until closing time. Heading home slightly buzzed but still coherent enough to navigate my way back without incident felt like a small victory under the circumstances. However, that sense of accomplishment was short-lived as I found myself face to face with one of the disturbing scenes I had dreaded encountering for weeks. Something utterly horrifying now staring me down in an unlit parking lot mere feet from my car. Whatever had been stalking me materialized right before my eyes, devoid of facial features, twisted and distorted like the stuff of nightmares, but undeniably human with malicious intent in its gait. I froze, terror strangling any potential scream stuck in my throat. The unthinkable happened. The creature lunged at me with a speed unattainable by any normal person. My heartbeat pounded violently in my chest as adrenaline surged through my veins. I glanced around, desperate for a means of escape or help. Desperation fueling me, I made the only choice available, to run. I sprinted away from the creature, feeling my legs become weaker with each step. Hearing its heavy, 
thudding footsteps behind me only made my fear grow even more intense. I knew I needed to find help, but in that moment, help felt impossibly far away. I darted around a corner and spotted someone up ahead, a security guard patrolling the area. I shouted to get his attention, and he noticed the terror-stricken look on my face. As I approached him, I frantically pointed back around the corner, trying to explain that something was chasing me. The guard, though clearly disconcerted by my panic state, bravely rounded the corner to confront whatever was following me. My heart raced as I caught my breath and tried to piece together what had just happened. Moments later, I heard a gut-wrenching scream and a loud thud. My stomach churned as I knew deep down what had occurred. The security guard was no match for that monstrous being. Out of nowhere, Evan appeared beside me, panting from having run up just in time to see what happened with the guard. As we stared at each other wordlessly, our mutual fear connected us in a way that transcended communication. Call it some strange combination of caution and bravery. But Evan and I looked at one another and agreed that we had to try to somehow lead the police back to this nightmarish creature while still keeping ourselves safe. We ran together towards the nearest police station. It felt like an eternity before we reached it. Every passing minute was another minute this unspeakable entity roamed free. Upon entering the station... We breathlessly recounted our experiences as officers listened closely and assessed what action needed to be taken immediately. A group of officers quickly armed themselves and followed us back toward where the monster had last been encountered. Their expressions were a mix of determination and dread. They had likely been briefed on the increasing number of disturbances in our town. As we cautiously approached the location where the security guard had met his demise, there was no sign of the creature. We discovered the guard's mangled body, and yet again, a fresh red paint-like substance trailed away from the scene. The officers called for backup and began to search the area. We were led back to the station for questioning and safety measures. As Evan and I sat next to each other, Waiting for updates on the situation, we couldn't shake off the feeling that something was amiss. There was a chilling unease in every conversation we tried to have, even when discussing unrelated topics. After several hours of searching, officers reported finding nothing. It seemed as though this malicious being had vanished without a trace, leaving only destruction and fear in its wake. Evan and I were eventually permitted to leave but advised not to wander alone after dark until further notice. As unnerving as that prospect was, it wasn't like either of us would willingly risk such an encounter again. Walking out of the police station into the streetlight-filled night, Evan and I hesitated before parting ways. Neither of us wanted to let down the fragile shield of safety provided by another person's company after what we had been through. That night is one I will never forget, but what haunts me more are the questions that were left unanswered. Who or what was responsible for these gruesome events? Were there more than one faceless human responsible? As days went on, no further sightings occurred but townspeople remained uneasy, whispering about how their once peaceful town was now marred by bloodshed. The unknown element loomed above us all, an ever-present reminder that at any moment, you might find yourself confronting a nightmare made real. Aberrant Butcher from Michael C. 22. I still can't believe that this happened to me on the 24th of October, 2014. I was a pretty average guy, married with one child, and working for an accounting firm. My friends often described my sense of humor as quirky and sarcastic, 
which made them laugh more often than not. The story begins when I receive a phone call from my neighbor, who mentioned that she noticed something odd going on in her backyard the previous night. She described it as a horrible mess, as if some wild animal had a gruesome feast. She asked if I'd seen anything unusual since our houses were close together, but I told her I hadn't. Little did we both know that fate had worse things in store for us. Days went by without any further incidents. My wife and I started to plan for our annual Halloween party, an event we hosted every year for our friends and neighbors to attend in casual costumes, play games, and have a good time. It was a chilly October night when our friend Sam offered to help set up the decorations in advance. While arranging the large fake spider web on our back porch, Sam suddenly cried out in terror. Something's on my face. Get it off. Get it off. Sam shrieked as he struggled with whatever horror clung to his visage. When Jack, my closest childhood friend, managed to remove it from Sam's face while wearing gloves, he held it up for us all to see. A bloody mass of pulsating flesh that seemed like it belonged in the world's worst nightmare rather than reality dangled between the gloves. Covered in blood-red veins and pulsing slightly, an utter abomination that none of us had ever seen or heard of before. As everyone was panicking about this grotesque discovery, one of our neighbors named Tom finally appeared from his house next door. He explained that he heard the commotion and came over to investigate. We showed him the bizarre horror we had uncovered, and soon our small suburban community was plagued with fear and uncertainty. A shocking incident like this would become known among my friends as the beginning of our descent into terror. With each passing day, we discovered more grotesque events happening around our neighborhood. People lost their pets, witnessed blood-stained windows and fences, or found disturbing phrases written on their cars or homes. During this same period, we began to notice a mysterious figure in the shadows of our quiet streets. Cloaked in darkness, this figure's presence was menacing and palpable. Their movements were erratic and unsettling. We could never predict when or where they would strike next. As neighbors reported more heinous discoveries, descriptions emerged of a faceless figure lurking in their peripheral vision just beyond the reach of recognition. Despite pooling resources to increase security and surveillance systems in our community, it was all for naught. The fear continued spreading throughout the neighborhood, breeding suspicion and superstition among those who once trusted one another. One fateful late night, as I was returning home after a long day at work, I stumbled upon a gut-wrenching sight at the entrance of my own house. Neatly arranged on my doorstep lay mutilated body parts, a horrifying tableau that sent tremors down my spine. My hands began shaking uncontrollably as I dialed 911, reporting the gruesome scene before me. It wasn't long before police flooded our neighborhood, interviewing everyone in an attempt to catch any leads that could help identify the perpetrator behind these horrific acts. Yet with each break-in, murder, or defacement that took place around us, it became increasingly clear that the faceless figure without remorse was still out there, watching, waiting, and plotting. Desperation had reached a boiling point as Jack and I decided to take matters into our own hands. We couldn't stand idly by, allowing our community to live in constant fear and distrust. With renewed purpose, we committed ourselves to finding this wretched fiend, scavenging for any possible clue that would bring their reign of terror to an end. We searched tirelessly throughout the night, determined to uncover the hidden source of our suffering. The wind howled around us as we sifted through piles of documents, photos, 
and anything else that could give us a sense of direction in our investigation. In our quest to uncover the truth, Jack and I started to gather evidence. We spoke to victims who had survived encounters with the faceless figure, cross-referencing their stories. While collecting information, we recognized subtle patterns and similarities in their accounts that unsettled us. As the gruesome events continued to unfold over the next few days, we meticulously documented every occurrence and meticulously analyzed each piece of evidence. But the sense of dread still loomed over our neighborhood. We were living in constant fear, not knowing when or where this relentless monster would strike again. I reported back to the police regularly with any leads or connections we discovered during our own unofficial investigations. The officers assured us they were doing everything within their power to catch this mysterious assailant, but try as they might, nothing seemed to slow down or stop this sinister force. One evening, as Jack and I walked home from yet another day of searching for clues, we heard panic screams coming from a nearby house. Without hesitating, we sprinted towards the source of the commotion. The front door was unlocked, so we cautiously entered the dimly lit home. We found a terrified woman huddled on the floor in her living room. She pointed at something in her kitchen. We looked in that direction and saw blood splattered all over her walls and floor. To our horror, she informed us that her husband's mutilated body had been dragged away by an inhuman force just moments before our arrival. Now even more determined to find answers, Jack and I spoke at length about every possible scenario and motive for these violent crimes but couldn't come up with any concrete explanation. We shared our findings with law enforcement agents, who continued their search for the perpetrator alongside us. Three days later, while combing through security footage from a nearby gas station on the night of one of the attacks, Jack made an alarming discovery. Images of people standing motionless by the roads, their faces obscured and indistinguishable. There wasn't just one faceless figure. There were multiple faceless people. Stunned by the revelation, we made several copies of the surveillance footage and handed them over to the police. We could only watch helplessly as they continued their investigation. The concept of multiple faceless people working in unison was beyond anything we could have imagined. They remained elusive, striking without pattern or reason, almost as if they wanted us to find them. As the days dragged on, our spirits fell. The fear that once bound our neighborhood together evolved into a haze of suspicion and paranoia. People began to wonder if the faceless monsters lived among us, disguised as familiar faces. The terror persisted, wearing thin on our collective sanity and well-being. As each gruesome act unfolded, hopelessness settled into our souls. Instead of answers, we found more questions and darkness. Two weeks after the dreadful discoveries began, I received an anonymous letter postmarked from several towns away. A cold shiver ran through my body as I read the chilling words. We are many, and we will never stop. I shared it with Jack, and together, we understood that these faceless beings were not mere monsters lurking in the shadows. They were faceless humans who had infiltrated our community from within. Toxic Heather from Jack Thundersmith Just a regular day, minding my own business. This happened to me on August 24, 2013. I was working my shift at an underfunded community center in small-town Oklahoma, Dillo Falls. It had been another day of supervising bored teenagers and dealing with obnoxious parents when I stumbled upon something unexpected, a small box by the vending machine. 
The package was peculiar. I debated whether to open it or not, glancing around the room to see if anyone was looking for it, but curiosity got the better of me. As I pried the lid open, the overwhelming stench of decay almost knocked me down. I almost screamed when I saw what was inside, rotting body parts. Maggots writhed in their putrid flesh. My stomach convulsed. I slammed the lid shut and backed away. Thoughts raced through my head. Was this some kind of sick joke? Why would someone leave body parts next to a snack machine? Hey, man! You all right? The voice startled me. It was Henry Thompson, a friend and city worker who frequently hung out at the community center. Uh, yeah? I stuttered as I explained what I found in the box. Henry's eyes widened in disbelief, and he cautiously peeked inside it, too. Dude, he whispered, we gotta report this. After notifying authorities and providing statements for hours on end, we finally returned home, our minds stained with gruesome images, and tried our best to resume life as usual. But after that day, things changed in our little town. The sense of security and safety we had taken for granted was shattered by those body parts found in that horrific box. Weeks passed with no updates or news. Tensions ran high within the town, and its citizens became more watchful at night. Not knowing who or what was responsible for the vile scene in the community center, everyone remained on edge. That's when I noticed that the hallways in my building seemed darker and more menacing. Unexplained noises, footsteps echoing from empty floors above. My mind, frayed from the paranoia seeping into our quaint town, was playing tricks on me. On one particularly nerve-wracking night, I had just locked up the community center when I discovered something that made my heart pound the shards of a bloodied prosthetic limb discarded in a janitor's closet. Just as I was about to call Henry and share my discovery, a dark figure screamed furiously from a nearby alleyway and launched themselves at me like a ballistic missile. I scrambled to dodge the attack. The protagonist managed to lunge at my chest, half choking me. The figure halted his attack when another voice shouted my name. The familiar warmth of Henry's voice cut across the panic-inducing scene. Get off him! He roared as he charged towards us like a freight train. Away from him, now! The faceless antagonist flung me down against the cold pavement and sprinted beyond view before anyone else could approach. Blood trickling down my chin... I struggled to regain control of my breaths among rapid gasps. The enormity of what had just happened washed over me. Someone was behind these hideous acts, shadowing me and targeting those around me. All thoughts of safety were tossed aside like garbage. How could I protect others? How could I protect myself? Henry pulled me to my feet his grip firm yet surprisingly gentle. You need help, he said, looking deep into my eyes with an intensity born from his fear for his friend. I know, I rasped weakly in acknowledgement of our shared dread. But we have no idea who or what we're up against. Limping home with Henry that night, we vowed to unmask the malevolent, faceless figure lurking in the shadows. The next day, the news reported nothing about the box, the prosthetic limb, or my near-death experience. One morning, I walked into work accompanied by a thick fog that seemed to swallow up anything beyond five feet. It left a palpable sense of menace in its wake. As I stepped into the Nauri building, a swarm of eyes followed my every move. A chilling realization solidified in my guts. Our enemy wasn't vanquished, but rather had just unveiled its ability to hide in plain sight. In the days that followed my attack, 
I decided to take cautionary measures. I installed security cameras around my home and requested a police patrol at the community center. Henry and I talked to our neighbors, encouraging them to be vigilant but without causing panic. One evening, while I was reviewing the security footage from the previous night, something caught my attention. I saw a hooded figure standing across the street from my building, seemingly observing it without moving. I called Henry to show him what I found. Maybe we should call the police, he suggested as we watched the video together. We don't have enough evidence for them to do anything, I responded. This is just a person standing on a sidewalk. We need something concrete to give them. The following day at work, we learned that another town's person had been assaulted not far from the community center. The victim described being attacked by someone with a blank face, no eyes or mouth, just an eerie void where features should be. This new information sent shivers through our town, but it also motivated Henry and me to become more proactive in gathering evidence. We decided not to call for outside help yet. We didn't want our small town to be flooded with media attention and meddling strangers before we had concrete evidence about our faceless attacker. As days passed, more incidents occurred in town. Windows shattered, personal belongings destroyed or stolen each accompanied by whispers of the faceless figure lurking around corners. Our townspeople grew increasingly terrified and frustrated at our inability to make sense of these gruesome crimes. After work one evening, Henry and I carefully surveyed the area surrounding my apartment building. We spoke with neighbors who had seen strange things on their own security cameras figures vanishing into thin air or shapes seemingly morphing before their eyes. With mounting evidence but still no clear answers, we continued our efforts to expose this elusive menace. One night, as I returned home, I noticed something odd in my security footage. The hooded figure I had seen earlier was back, but this time they were entering my apartment building. As they entered the dimly lit lobby, their hoods slipped back, revealing their horrifyingly blank visage. In sheer panic, I called Henry and started to pack a bag, planning to leave town and seek safety elsewhere until we could figure out what was happening. Grab anything important. We can't stay here any longer. It's not safe. I warned Henry over the phone before hanging up. Just as we met outside my apartment building with our bags in hand, the faceless figure appeared again. It moved toward us with unnatural speed. We had no choice but to run and attempt to seek refuge in a nearby store. As people screamed and scattered around us, Henry and I realized that we couldn't keep hiding from this faceless force terrorizing our town any longer. We decided it was time to confront our fear head-on and either expose or banish this evil presence once and for all. With a shared nod of determination, we turned around to face our attacker as it emerged into the dim glow of the streetlights. Hatred burned in its featureless face. That's enough, we yelled together. We know who you are. The creature stopped briefly but continued towards us relentlessly. In that moment, the truth became clear. Our small town was not being haunted by some supernatural presence but by a group of faceless humans committing unspeakable crimes under the cover of darkness and fear. The figure paused for just a second before sprinting into an alleyway. We knew then that there were more behind him a group rather than just one individual preying upon our community's vulnerability. Breathing heavily from the adrenaline rush of our confrontation, we made a solemn vow. Together, we would bring these faceless people to justice, protecting our town and ensuring the safety of our friends, family, and neighbors. The nightmare was not over, but we were determined to make sure it would be soon.
The Encounter on Oak Street from Jacob Trustworthy I always had a hard time sleeping. This happened to me on October 12, 2017. For the past several years, I had been living with my family, my wife Sarah and our two kids, David and Allie, in a small town just outside of Pittsburgh. We're just your average family. I work a 9-to-5 job at the local car dealership, while Sarah focuses on raising our children and running her own small business. We all have our quirks and bad habits. Mine is smoking. I picked it up back in college and never kicked the habit. Friday nights were always reserved for hanging out with close friends. We usually gathered at Randy's house. He was a funny guy who had this thing for telling dark jokes. He's been my best friend since childhood. That night at Randy's place began as you would expect. We shared some laughs and talked about work and life over beers, all while playing a competitive game of poker. Somewhere along the way, the conversation turned more somber. It seemed that everyone in town had noticed a string of strange events happening recently. Pets gone missing, property damage with no apparent cause, and some people even claimed they had witnessed faceless figures skulking around in the streets late at night. Randy ended the night reminiscing about old memories, making sure we all left his place feeling better than when we first arrived. As I stepped out into the brisk night air for my usual cigarette before heading home, I suddenly heard the unmistakable sound of anguished screams coming from down Oak Street. Instinctively running toward the source, heart pounding in my chest, I found myself standing outside our town's pharmacy. Its doors were open wide, which seemed strange given how late it was. Standing there hesitantly for a moment, Contemplating what to do next, I finally decided that I was not leaving without knowing what had happened, but I also couldn't risk my life. Calling the police from a safe distance, I watched as many of my neighbors started to trickle out of their homes, drawn by curiosity and fear. The police arrived within minutes, rapidly cordoning off the area and questioning witnesses who had seen or heard anything. As they relentlessly searched the premises and surrounding areas for any signs of the attacker or information on what had occurred, we could see blood and evidence left behind, indicating it had been a grisly scene. Standing there among the other concerned residents of my quiet town, we shared theories about who could have committed such heinous acts in our sleepy neighborhood. Everything from secret criminal organizations to supernatural killers started making the rounds in whispers. As much as we wanted answers to these horrible incidents, none were forthcoming. The attacker was never identified or caught. We were only left with troubling questions about who was responsible for these attacks in our town, questions that still haunt us to this day. Tension hung heavy in the air for weeks following that gruesome evening on Oak Street. People became more cautious, locking their doors and avoiding venturing out after dark if they could help it. Every night that passed only served to heighten our anxiety and fear of another attack. Never before had my once idyllic hometown felt so unsafe. This unease steadily transformed into full-blown panic when another blood-curdling scream rang out in the night, this time coming from our children's school, just down the road from Oak Street. That following night at the children's school, I hid behind trees, fear and worry consuming me. I saw the police quickly arrive at the scene, their sirens blaring loudly. I watched as they cautiously entered the school with guns drawn, ready to confront whatever had caused the scream. Some of my neighbors had gathered nearby, murmuring nervously as they waited for updates. We exchanged glances with each other in shared dread. No one wanted to imagine what might have happened inside those walls. 
I realized that our once peaceful town was under constant threat. Instead of drawing closer to investigate or help, I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed my friend Randy. After a brief exchange, we agreed to gather at his house immediately after the police completed their investigation. In trying times like these, we needed each other's company and support. Huddled in Randy's living room a few hours later, my friends and I discussed the unsettling events that had taken place. We tried to make sense of it all and come up with ways to protect ourselves. The idea of forming a neighborhood watch was discussed, a way to keep an eye on each other's homes and children. Despite our efforts at finding a solution, we could not ignore the horrifying reality. Something or someone was terrorizing our town, and we didn't know who or what they were. For now, all we could do was wait for the police to discover some clue that would lead them closer to capturing this terror. My heart raced with every passing day as more frightening incidents occurred across town. They happened without warning, sometimes on quiet nights when everything seemed normal, sometimes on busy days when people didn't expect danger around them. Finally, after days of feeling helpless and anxious, there was a significant break in the case. A witness reported seeing multiple hooded figures fleeing from one of the crime scenes where another terrible act had been committed. The police promptly shared this information with the public, encouraging anyone with knowledge about these faceless perpetrators to come forward. I couldn't shake the feeling that our town's nightmare was far from over. Fear gripped us tighter each day as the anticipation of further violence weighed on our minds. In the days that followed, faceless figures continued to terrorize our community, and more witnesses came forward with accounts of the attackers' bone-chilling resemblance to humans. But these figures had blank faces, void of any features or emotions. One night, while walking home after a neighborhood watch patrol, I experienced a sudden gut-wrenching moment of clarity. It all made sense— the disappearances, the property damage, even Randy's sometimes too precise knowledge of where events had occurred. I stopped in my tracks and shuddered at the realization that Randy was somehow involved with these faceless humans who were attacking our town. The Unseen Torturer, from James O'Connor, 55. I never thought my quiet, humdrum life would become the target of such brutality. This happened to me on October 15, 2014. I'm just your average middle-aged guy, a bit of a loner with a steady job as a forklift operator at a local warehouse. My family? We are all scattered across the country and we mostly stick to the occasional phone call or holiday card. My social life? Practically non-existent since my divorce three years ago. The only thing remotely interesting about me is my crippling addiction to cherry-flavored cough drops. Living in Burlington, Vermont, it wasn't uncommon for me to take long walks through my favorite park to pass the time on weekends. On that fateful day, I met up with Tina, my co-worker and probably my closest friend, for some coffee and casual conversation near the park's entrance. As we walked along the winding path, we couldn't help but notice something disgusting hanging by a thread from an old oak tree. It was an animal's organ, maybe a kidney or liver. It was hard to tell from where we stood. We both shuddered and moved away from the grotesque sight. We continued our walk, trying to shake off the disturbing discovery, when Tina spotted something else alarming, a trail of what appeared to be dried blood leading into the thick brush surrounding the park. We should call someone about this, she suggested nervously. I agreed, pulling out my phone and dialing 911. 
The dispatcher promised they would send someone right away. Trying our best not to worry, Tina and I started making our way back to her car when I felt something heavy hit me behind the knees. I was knocked off balance and fell forward onto the ground. Tina screamed as she saw what had caused my fall. Heavy metal chains had been swung at me with brutal force, leaving my legs bruised and throbbing in pain. The other end of the chain seemingly vanished into the bushes. As I tried to stand up, another object flew from the same direction, striking Tina's shoulder and causing her to cry out in pain. It was a lead pipe, rusty and coated in something wet and sticky that smelled like rotten meat. Panicking, we began to run toward her car as fast as our injuries would allow. The feeling of being chased by an unseen force sent adrenaline rushing through our veins. With each pounding of our hearts, an unseen dread continued to rise. We hobbled back to her car, barely managing to fumble with the keys long enough to unlock it. Just as we were about to pull away, a flurry of bricks pelted her windshield, shattering the glass into countless tiny shards. We could hear a sinister cackling echoing from the surrounding trees. Terrified and in agony from the attack, we were finally able to escape the park and drive back to my house. We took solace in the fact that we could seek medical help there and find a safer place for both ourselves and others. But as we pulled up to my house, we found that horror had followed us home. My front door was splintered as if it had been kicked down by an extremely strong force. I was scared out of my mind. Ignoring the pain in my legs, I helped Tina to her feet, and with urgency I yelled, We need to get inside, now! We limped through the broken entrance, and quickly locked the back door behind us. I grabbed my phone again, this time calling the police once more to tell them about the break-in at my house. The dispatcher assured us that officers were on their way and should arrive soon. I guided Tina to my small living room and had her sit down on the couch. We kept quiet, both fearing that our attacker might still be around. A few minutes later, we heard sirens approaching. Relief washed over me as I opened the front door to find police officers waiting. I quickly filled them in on what had happened at the park and in front of my house. The officers exchanged concerned glances before providing first aid and taking our statements. One officer went back outside and began examining the scene. As we waited for news from the officers investigating, I noticed how tense Tina had become. She looked out of my broken front door apprehensively. I can't believe this is happening. She whispered. Who would do something like this? I shrugged, uncertain. It was hard to comprehend why anyone would want to hurt us like that, especially in such a brutal fashion. Suddenly, one of the officers came back inside with a grim look on his face. He held a small evidence bag containing what seemed like a bloody note. We found this pinned to your door, he said carefully. It seems like someone is targeting you. It took me a second to process his words before I asked hesitantly, Can you tell us what it says? The officer cleared his throat before reading. You escaped me once, but luck won't save you forever. Terror gripped me tighter than the metal chains that had wrapped around my legs earlier. This wasn't just an isolated incident. We were being stalked by a menacing figure intent on causing us harm. The police conducted a thorough search of the area but found no further clues as to the identity of our attacker. Before leaving, they advised us to seek somewhere safer to stay until they apprehended the culprit. I knew staying at my house was out of the question, so Tina and I decided to go to her place for the night. As we reached her apartment and locked the door behind us, 
I couldn't help but fear that we hadn't escaped our assailant's grasp. Realizing that we were not dealing with just a random attacker but rather someone who seemed intent on terrorizing us, I knew that it would only be a matter of time before they struck again. Desperate for answers, Tina and I tried to think if we had any enemies or possible suspects who might want revenge. It took us hours, but finally, we came up with a possibility— a group of faceless individuals who had been recently fired from our company due to their violent actions on the job. We informed the police about this revelation and hoped that it would help in capturing those responsible for our torment. Finally, at the end of their investigation, the police managed to confirm our suspicions. The attackers were indeed a group of faceless people we both knew from work who sought retaliation for their dismissal. Although some members of the group were apprehended, others managed to evade arrest. With this unsettling knowledge, both Tina and I knew that if they remained at large, meeting them again was a chilling prospect too gruesome to imagine. The Creeping Shape, from Jason Brighton, 15. I absolutely despise car trouble. This happened to me on the 5th of November, 2003. I had been out of town for a conference when my old car gave up the ghost. I guess that's what I get for relying on a jalopy. A 25-mile hike brought me to the nearest small town, Pleasant Oaks. As I entered John's Auto Services, a fellow customer waiting in the small lounge greeted me with a crooked smile and an afternoon. Her name was Nancy Daniels, she told me. Nancy had a distinct southern drawl and owned one of the local diners in town. After a brief examination of my tired, broken car, John informed me it would take at least three days to fix it. I sighed heavily and headed to Nancy's diner for some much-needed comfort food. That evening, I found myself chatting with Nancy and some regulars in her diner about their day-to-day -day lives. They told me strange stories about unusual incidents around town, livestock found ripped apart, gruesome vandalism at their community center, and homes broken into every few weeks that left people distraught. I chuckled nervously but didn't think much of it until later that night as I walked back to the little motel nearby where I was staying. The streets were quiet, with only a dim street light illuminating the stretch from a distance. Out of nowhere, a chilling scream echoed through the night air. With my heart pounding in my chest, I ran towards the source and found Nancy's younger cousin Ben huddled by his damaged car. He was shivering violently and badly shaken when he described his attacker as a huge, faceless man, with powerful arms who disappeared almost instantly after cornering him. We made our way back to my motel room, where we both tried, unsuccessfully, to sleep as paranoia crept into our thoughts. Although my skepticism was still intact, the unsettling air of the evening seemed to disagree. The next day, I found myself with some locals who shared their own chilling stories. Each account featured the same faceless figure making threats and spreading terror anywhere it went. It seemed as if the whole town was on edge. By nightfall, I became acutely aware that this faceless entity might not be a figment of people's imaginations. A heavy sense of dread settled over me as I locked my motel door and attempted to sleep, but sleep wouldn't come. Around midnight, I heard the distant sound of shattering glass, followed by screams and chaos coming from down the street. Fueled by fear and a foolish sense of bravery, I grabbed my pocket knife, which now felt more like a flimsy toothpick than a weapon, and went out to see what was going on. Several people had gathered near Tom's Market, 
which now had its front windows smashed in from the brazen attack by the faceless nightmare. Tom's neighbor recounted how she saw, just moments ago, that horrifying figure hurling bricks through the glass before tearing an unfortunate passerby apart. As she described her experience in great detail, with everyone listening with horrifying awe and trepidation, we noticed that a gruff and tough-looking man named Luke suddenly took off like a bolt of lightning towards his humble residence located near the edge of town. He insisted that he needed to secure his family and home before something happened to them. We watched him disappear into the night, knowing we wouldn't just stand idly by while one of our own faced danger alone. Thus began our tense journey through deserted streets towards Luke's house. The inky black sky seemed to breathe terror into our very souls. Reaching Luke's residence felt like years had passed before we finally encountered him just outside his front door, wielding a shotgun anxiously. He beckoned us closer, shushing us to keep quiet. As we gathered beside him, we noticed the faintest sound of shallow breaths from within his home. We cautiously entered Luke's home and were greeted by the sight of his terrified wife, Sarah, clutching their toddler. We tried to calm her down and gathered in a huddle, discussing our next move. Police intervention was discussed, but we realized they wouldn't believe us and would only bring unwanted attention to our community. It felt like a losing battle. Days later, as the faceless terror continued to plague our town, more people united to protect their loved ones and neighborhoods. Attempts were made to set up search parties and groups to patrol the streets, but every attempt ended in tragedy. This creature was relentless and seemed impossible to confront or escape. One day, a breakthrough came from Tom's neighbor, who had witnessed its attack on the market just a few nights ago. She noticed the faceless figure was always seen near the locations of attacks but was never present during them. She concluded that the entity must have had some control over its surroundings that allowed it to vanish momentarily during daylight hours. This revelation gave us hope that we could exploit its weakness and catch it off guard. We regrouped at Luke's house, creating a plan that entailed remaining indoors during daylight hours, with people traveling only in groups until sunset, when everyone would return home and lock themselves inside. As dusk approached, I listened to the faint whispers of everyone's goodbyes before returning to their families for another night of fear-induced insomnia. Although sleep would be elusive again due to heightened awareness and vigilance, there was a sense of unity among us against this faceless killer. Late one night after following this new routine, I began hearing thuds in the distance. It sounded like something making a hurried escape through backyards and alleyways. My heart hammered in my chest as I grabbed my flashlight and swung open my front door scanning the area while joining my fellow townspeople as they armed themselves with makeshift weapons. We knew we had cornered the faceless monster, and the primal act of survival unified everyone further. We tracked the direction of the thuds, eventually finding ourselves in a dead-end alleyway. The darkness seemed thicker here, but our adrenaline fueled us to press forward. As we inched closer, we could see a figure hunched over, breathing heavily. My flashlight illuminated the outline of features forming on its face, as if it were becoming less powerful due to our combined efforts. The faceless horror staggered up and looked at us with fear, a turn of events that we would have relished if not for the dread we still felt. The figure began backing away slowly, as if realizing that it couldn't win against an entire town united against it. As it retreated into the darkness of the alleyway and disappeared from view, we heard it murmur something incomprehensible. The whispers added more dread and mystery to its existence, 
only leaving us with questions and speculation about who or what it was or what their motives were. Recovered as a town from these harrowing events, people moved on with their lives while keeping their guard high, aware that such an evil had once haunted our streets. But these scars would always remind us that by facing adversity and terror together as a community, we became stronger. In hindsight, upon uncovering some old newspapers and connecting the dots of various accounts from survivors, it became apparent that our tormentor had once been part of a secret medical experiment gone awry, leaving its test subjects faceless and driven by an insatiable need to spread fear. The Strange Case of Faceless Ben, from John Smith 22, is a tale I can't forget. This happened to me on November 13, 2013. That morning, I was in my early thirties and experiencing a midlife crisis. I had just lost my job and was drowning myself in alcohol, only to be saved by grace an energetic lady who worked at the rehab facility I ended up at. She convinced me to get back into the real world. Newly sober, I decided to rent a nondescript apartment in New Orleans and start fresh. The first few weeks crawled by uneasily. I found solace walking through nearby parks with Naomi, my beloved golden retriever. On a rainy Tuesday afternoon, we stumbled upon something that sent my heart racing. On a damp park bench sat what looked like chunks of human flesh, bloodied and torn apart carelessly. Repulsed and curious, Naomi growled at the sight. We rushed home, the scene imprinted on us. As days turned into weeks of living in New Orleans while keeping up with AA meetings and making new friends like Jake Roberts, our building's security guard, I shared this strange find with him at one of our coffee runs on Sundays. He spoke about an odd case he heard from another tenant, Rosemary. About Faceless Ben, history goes that people trapped in his line of sight are said to disappear as if they vanished into thin air. Worse yet, some have speculated that Faceless Ben feasts upon his victims after gruesomely mutilating them. I laughed it off, but Naomi wasn't the same since that day. She refused to enter parks and grew unusually timid. Months passed, and strange screams echoed throughout our neighborhood at night, calming down locals, while rumors spilled all over the neighborhood, claiming they were done by Faceless Ben. I dismissed it all as an urban myth until one horrifying night when Jake dropped by for pizza. We opened the door to a terrifying sight on my doormat, a severed human hand, mangled and bloody, with the fingers bent unnaturally. My suspicions grew. Horrified, we slammed the door and locked it. My heart raced with fear, and I dialed 911. Wait! Jake grabbed my arm. You think they'll believe us? Feeling defeated, I had no idea what to say or do. The next morning, a package arrived, something heavy wrapped in old newspapers. Jake hesitated before opening it. When he unveiled the gruesome contents, multiple dismembered human limbs, he dropped it out of pure shock. Determined to prove our innocence when we reported an anonymous tip and an unlikely discovery beneath park benches, an officer found ominous mutilated body parts. The city buzzed with panic as Faceless Ben was believed to be lurking somewhere in New Orleans. We never caught even a glimpse of him, but this knowledge didn't save me from the terror I'd feel sitting alone at night. Naomi snuggled close for comfort. My life took a new turn as I stayed in New Orleans. I made sure to avoid parks and any other suspicious locations following the horrifying incidents with mangled body parts and mysterious disappearances. 
Jake and I continued to be close friends, looking out for one another in our secretive community. One evening, while I was getting ready for bed, I received a distressing call from Jake. He sounded panicked. Apparently, Rosemary had gone missing after she left her apartment to take out the trash. We knew we needed help to find her, so we decided to call the police. After giving a detailed statement on Rosemary's disappearance and our own gruesome encounters with human remains, the police decided to launch an investigation into the matter. They assured us that they would notify us of any updates or if they needed our assistance. Despite the police's involvement, sleep eluded me that night. The terror of knowing that someone or something capable of brutal dismemberment might still be lurking out there haunted me constantly. Naomi sensed my unease and didn't leave my side, day or night. A few days after the police commenced their search for Rosemary, the phone rang once more. This time it was Detective Thompson on the line informing me that they found what appeared to be Rosemary's belongings near an abandoned warehouse outside of town. He urged me to warn Jake and other neighborhood residents about avoiding unfamiliar areas and taking precautions when going about daily activities. Following the detective's advice, I gathered my neighbors in a community meeting where we discussed safety measures like establishing a buddy system while walking around the neighborhood and regularly checking in on one another. However, these precautionary steps didn't stop another bone-chilling case from occurring in our vicinity. Blood-curdling screams echoed through our once peaceful streets during twilight hours. Everyone started believing that faceless Ben had returned with his heinous acts of violence. In light of these events, the police decided to increase patrols around our area, hoping to catch the faceless perpetrator red-handed. Tension hung in the air like a heavy fog, weighing on everyone's minds. Then one night, after another unsettling scream erupted seemingly out of nowhere, the police officers on patrol caught someone fleeing the scene. It was a faceless human, barely recognizable as remotely human in appearance. On being interrogated, it was revealed that there were more than one of these faceless beings, remnants of a sinister experiment gone wrong. They had found solace in preying on innocent people by mutilating their bodies. The police vowed to locate and apprehend the rest of these horrifying creatures. House of Horrors from Alex Johnson 502 I really have to tell you about my visit to a friend's house on the 5th of July, 2019. I had known Brian for years, since both of us work as freelance videographers in Ohio. Typically, every year, we meet up at each other's place to catch up and take a well-deserved break from work. On that particular day, I had just landed at Akron Canton Airport and was heading straight to Brian's residence. Everything started smoothly. Brian welcomed me warmly and we had a little catch-up over a couple of beers in his living room. We laughed about our crazy projects this past year and the new businesses we ventured into concurrently. For Brian, it was his recent interest in eBay auctions that involved buying peculiar antique items. However, just when the night seemed pretty normal and fun, events took an unexpected turn. Our typical get-together transformed into absolute terror when we discovered something harrowing about one of those, charming, antiques he bought recently. Brian showed me his latest auction win, an old wooden trunk filled with weather journals and manuscripts. The handwritten cover page depicted a faceless character referred to only as the ghoul. Surely, these books were meant to reveal some gruesome past events using evocative illustrations, 
a dark history that left chilling shivers down our spines. Curiosity overcame us, naturally. As we flipped through page after discolored page, we couldn't help but shake the feeling that the horrors relayed in those books seemed more like reality than fantasy. In fact, everything became too real soon enough. Around midnight, or so, we heard an ear-piercing scream from Brian's neighbor's house. Something had attacked their dog. Rex's panicked shouts erupted from next door as they frantically tried to rescue poor Rex from an unknown attacker. Still in shock and disbelief, Brian and I peered cautiously through the window, only to see bloody claw marks on the ground leading toward our backyard. My heart thudded heavily in my chest. We knew whatever or whoever was responsible for the mauling of the dog was now lurking close. As if on cue, shrill cries rang out from beyond the wooden fence, more unfortunate victims facing a similar fate. Red and blue lights rapidly flashed around our neighborhood as police arrived on the scene to try and uncover who, or what, was causing such gruesome havoc. With no cellular signal and severed landlines, calling for help wasn't an option. All we could do was barricade ourselves inside, silently praying that the faceless monstrosity would leave us unscathed. The deep scratches and thumps that resonated in the room did little to provide solace. As Brian pressed against one of his much-lauded antique chairs to reinforce the doors barricading us inside, I tried my best to remain calm amidst mounting trepidation. We were defenseless, armed only with kitchen utensils, not nearly enough to fend off an assailant capable of inflicting wounds that looked so repulsive and violated natural laws. Our terror was mixed with morbid awe over such capabilities spanning beyond human understanding. As the night continued, the police started knocking on our door forcing us to remove the barricades and face them. They informed us of a series of violent activities and murders in the neighborhood and advised us to stay indoors. Thinking it was their duty to protect us, we let them remain stationed outside our house, keeping an eye on the surroundings. The following day, we took shifts. Brian stayed awake while I attempted to get some rest wary of what surrounded us. By evening, however, we heard gunshots coming from the front of our house. When we hurried out to check on the police officers, our eyes widened at the sight before us. The two officers who guarded our house lay dead on the ground. Their bodies had been gruesomely mutilated, as if torn apart by wild animals. Blood and entrails littered the area, creating a sickening stench that filled our nostrils. Brian called for backup through the officers' walkie-talkies, but all we received was radio static. When other police officers arrived later that night, Brian and I felt tense. Were they truly here to help or face a similar fate? We couldn't escape the fear that hunted us in the darkness. Frustrated by our inability to seek help from outside and receiving no answers from authorities, Brian began digging furiously through the journals he found in that cursed trunk. As we read more about the ghoul, we piece together information about its origin. Now convinced this mysterious creature was responsible for these horrors fresh in our minds, we felt compelled to act against it somehow. We inspected all possible exits from Brian's house and frantically searched for any hints regarding this creature's weaknesses. The next night, as I stared through a window, searching for any sign of impending danger, I spotted something moving near one of our neighbor's homes. A hulking figure moved with great speed and agility, silently stalking its next victim. The being's face was concealed and seemed eerily human, a notion both terrifying and intriguing. With immense fear gripping us tightly, we decided to arm ourselves with whatever makeshift weapons we could find in our surroundings. 
We observed the ghoul from a distance, noting the horrendous extent of its brutal attacks. In a heart-stopping moment, the ghoul lunged at one of our neighbors who had ventured outside for an unknown reason. We couldn't just stand there and watch, so we sprang into action without any regard for our safety. Brian threw makeshift spears towards the ghoul, while I used my steel baseball bat to strike it several times. The neighbors we saved were now part of our desperate group, sharing the same hostile fate as this supernatural predator. We retreated back into Brian's house. Our impromptu team found unexpected strength through cooperation and willpower to survive the faceless killer's onslaught. For two days, we endured a series of physical and psychological challenges by fortifying the house, setting up security measures, and preparing ourselves for another encounter with the ghoul. Every night brought increased terror as mutilated bodies continued to pile up in the neighborhood. Blood-curdling sounds coming from afar kept us wide awake, a chilling reminder that death was lingering just beyond reach. It didn't take long for theories regarding the ghoul to surface among us. We started believing its creation was somehow connected to the manuscripts, perhaps documented by someone involved in occult practices. When it was revealed that those responsible for unleashing this terror on our community were faceless humans using dark rituals long forgotten by time, it was too late for redemption. As the screams echoed through the night one last time, we questioned whether those twisted individuals even comprehended the chaotic evil they voluntarily unleashed upon all of us, or if they themselves fell victim to their nightmarish creation. Terrifying Discoveries the Faceless Neighbors, from Jamson 5478. I still have nightmares about the incident that happened in my hometown, a small suburb in Ohio. This happened to me on October 11, 2017. My name is Dennis Jameson. I'm an average guy with a solid accounting job in the city and a loving wife named Elizabeth. We have two children and have lived a comfortable life on Maplewood Drive. Our friends and family were always close by, and our days never deviated from our mundane routines. One evening, while I was checking our mailbox after work, I found a crudely folded note lying on our doorstep. With curiosity piqued, I unfolded it to find a disturbing statement written in haphazard handwriting that sent chills down my spine. The gods don't recognize faceless ones. I immediately showed the note to Elizabeth. She reassured me that it was probably just a prank by some mischievous kids in the neighborhood, but I wasn't so sure. Children would usually opt for ringing doorbells or throwing eggs at houses rather than leaving cryptic messages. Two weeks later, during our weekly grocery run at the local supermarket, we also overheard whispers among the shoppers about faceless people with abnormal behavior lurking around town at night. That scuttlebutt only heightened my anxiety. Then, one unsettling Saturday morning, our children claimed that they saw someone staring at our house through our backyard fence's gaps that night. They went on to describe the person as empty where their face should be. Both Elizabeth and I tried to calm them down by explaining that it could have been just imaginations born from an overactive mind after watching scary movies or hearing local gossip. As days went by without further incidents, Things seemed to return to normal for us, until the gruesome discovery in Mr. Smith's yard next door broke the illusion. While mowing his lawn, Mr. Smith found something buried in the freshly turned soil behind his shed. It was a dismembered hand, still clutched in a tight fist. His terrified scream caught the attention of everyone around, and soon the police arrived to examine the scene. 
The horror and panic in our small suburb soared to an unimaginable height when similar discoveries were made throughout the town, body parts turning up on manicured lawns, alleyways, and even playgrounds. Sleepless nights became a regular occurrence, as all residents could only anticipate their fate with dread and paranoia, their worst nightmares manifesting into reality. One evening, while returning home from work after another grueling day filled with fear and anxiety, I noticed the front door of our house wide open. Rushing inside, a grisly scene awaited me. Elizabeth lay motionless on the living room floor near the broken glass vase that once held our anniversary flowers. As panic engulfed me, I quickly checked for a pulse, which, to my immense relief, was still there, albeit faint. Glancing down at her hand, I realized she clutched a photograph of us taken during our recent vacation. This must have been an attempt to cling to any happy memory during her last conscious moments before helplessly collapsing into the darkness of her mind after witnessing what had happened here. Daddy? My heart plummeted into my stomach when I heard my children call out from upstairs. Fearing the worst for them yet too afraid of uncovering another horror waiting around the corner, I hesitated to climb towards their voices. But I realized it was my responsibility as their father. I had to check on them. Bracing myself for whatever assault might be expected, I burst into their room only to find them huddled together under blankets with expressions of terror radiating from their wet eyes. Relief washed over me as I embraced them tightly. As adrenaline coursed through our veins, we prepared to make our escape. However, a shrill peal of laughter coming from the living room froze us in our steps. The sickening sound echoed through the house, taunting the only sanctuary we had ever known. Before I could even react, I heard heavy footsteps approaching. And then, for just a moment, a figure momentarily appeared through the doorframe of the room, a faceless, menacing presence. I knew I had to protect my children, so I quickly grabbed them and took them to the basement, hoping it would be safer. As I bolted the door shut, my thoughts raced to find a way to call for help without alerting the faceless person. Do you have your phone with you? I asked my children. No, Daddy, they whispered, shaking their heads in unison. In that moment, I realized if we tried to go back upstairs to retrieve a phone or leave the house, we could be met with the faceless individual. Our best option was to stay in our makeshift fortress and find something to defend ourselves if needed. I scanned the basement storage for any tools or weapons that could offer protection. Settling on a hefty wrench and an old baseball bat, I handed one to each of my children and kept one for myself. We huddled together in silence as we listened for any signs of the intruder, amplifying each creak of the floorboards above. But as hours of tense silence passed by, our exhausted bodies began to drain our resolve. Unable to postpone the need for help any longer, I decided it was time for us to act. With a surge of terrified determination, I led my children up the stairs slowly and cautiously, opening the door from our basement haven into the darkened house. The stillness was eerie as we made our way to where Elizabeth lay unconscious. Upon seeing her untouched during our absence, relief washed over me. However, there was no time to waste. Dreading what might happen next, I hurried my children out of the house as they clung tightly to me. Once we safely reached our neighbor's house across the street, my heart pounded in anticipation as they dialed 911 on their landline phone. The operator assured us that help was on the way. As we waited anxiously by the window, only able to see our house, memories of happier times flashed before my eyes, and a bitter realization settled in. 
the tranquility of our lives had been violently appended, possibly forever. Soon enough, the sirens announced the arrival of both police and an ambulance. Officers stormed into our home while medics tended to Elizabeth, whom they found alive but still unconscious. The police interviewed each of us and our neighbors in an attempt to piece together what had occurred and find those responsible. As we stayed with Mr. Smith during the investigation, I couldn't help but think about his discovery in his yard just days earlier. It seemed impossible that these events were unrelated. Unable to shake the unsettling feeling that something sinister underpinned these horrors happening around us, I shared my thoughts with the officers. They nodded solemnly before announcing that they had found evidence of connections between the series of attacks on our street. The perpetrators had apparently been masquerading as a faceless tempest of terror tormenting our town, though their motive remained unknown. It wasn't until much later that we learned that these acts were committed by a cult, faceless people whose warped belief system drove them to terrorize communities in search of new recruits. Although their origins were unclear, fragments of their terrifying history lingered long after their capture. That night taught me one thing. Even in this world full of darkness and despair, our only hope is to cling tightly to those we love, because you never know when there might be faceless monsters lurking nearby. Sorry for the Nightmares, from Joe Simmons The day started out quite ordinary. This happened to me on June 15, 2018. Back then, I was working as a plumber in a small suburban Illinois town. It was a comfortable job with few unpleasant surprises. And I've always been a loyal friend. My closest friends would even call me their confidant and they often shared their secrets with me over the years. That particular day, a long-term co-worker and friend named Jasper invited me over to his house for an unexpected dinner invitation. I couldn't shake off the sensation that something was off about the evening, but I attributed it to simple exhaustion from the workday. As we dined, he told me about his recent breakup with his girlfriend, who had moved out of the house earlier that week. He explained how their last argument escalated beyond control until she packed her bags and left in a rage. I tried to offer Jasper some words of encouragement, assuring him that everything would get better in time. In response, he showed me an old puzzle box he had discovered while cleaning the attic after she left. The intricate craftsmanship fascinated me, as if I couldn't help but try to solve it. After dinner, Jasper excused himself to use the bathroom and left me alone with the puzzle box in the living room. As I tinkered with it absent-mindedly, I accidentally solved one part of the puzzle, just as Jasper returned. Immediately after that moment, horribly timed or not, we both heard horrible screams coming from outside the house. We exchanged anxious glances and headed out into his backyard together, where we found half-eaten neighborhood pets scattered everywhere, dismembered and mangled like discarded ragdolls. The gruesome scene sent shockwaves through our cores, prompting us to rush back inside for our safety. Unbeknownst to us at the time, we had unknowingly left the door unlocked in our panic. We grabbed whatever makeshift weapons we could find, Jasper a baseball bat from his closet, and a kitchen knife I retrieved while heading back toward the living room. We paced the house cautiously, searching for any trace of an intruder or explanation for the gruesome scene outside. But as we scoured each corner and crevice, even checking windows and doors to ensure they were all locked, we found nothing. Our paranoia increased with each passing moment. Whispers of terror floated amongst us, 
but we scarcely allowed ourselves to voice our thoughts. The silence only aggravated our growing consternation. And that's when it happened. Another series of screams erupted from inside the house, this time much closer than before. Jasper's grip tightened around his baseball bat as he barked at me to follow him. I shifted my grip on the kitchen knife and accompanied him as we climbed the stairs toward those horrifying sounds. As we approached his bedroom, our hearts raced wildly. The door stood slightly ajar, revealing traces of smeared blood and claw marks inset into the once pristine wood. Taking a deep breath, Jasper pushed open the door. We gasped as we saw his ex-girlfriend, or what remained of her, spread across their shared bed. Her lifeless eyes still gazed towards us as though pleading for help that would never come. The revelation sent us both reeling backward into an instinctual fight-or-flight mindset as footsteps echoed rapidly through the house, accompanied by a sadistic, guttural laughter sourced from an indiscernible identity taking pleasure in this grisly madness. As the laughter continued, Jasper and I decided we needed help. We dashed downstairs, turned the lock on the front door, and threw it open. Without hesitation, we ran to the neighbor's house and banged on their door, begging them to call the police. The minutes that followed felt like an eternity. We stood on the porch of the neighbor's house, surveying our surroundings for any sign of danger. At last, the wailing sirens and flashing blue lights became visible in the distance. A wave of relief washed over us as the police arrived. Officers quickly swept through Jasper's house, searching for any clues or evidence surrounding the horrifying events that had taken place. The police warned us not to enter until they had completed their investigation. Hours seemed to pass as we waited anxiously. When they finally emerged, a solemn-faced officer approached Jasper and me. He began to ask questions about what we had experienced and if any unusual activity had occurred in recent days before the bloody scene unfolded. As we recounted our story, a mix of terror and confusion filled his eyes. As more officers left Jasper's house, a sinking feeling overwhelmed both of us. There were still no answers or explanations for what we had encountered that night. The days that followed were nothing short of a nightmare. Jasper couldn't return home and stayed with friends instead, while I offered emotional support as best I could. The investigation revealed very little about who or what was responsible for this tragedy. No signs of forced entry or clues pointing towards a possible suspect were found by the police. They even questioned if this was somehow connected to our accidental unlocking of the puzzle box but with no solid leads or understanding as to how such an object could inflict such violence, they couldn't offer any conclusive answers. Without resolution, life eventually started returning to normalcy, at least as much as normal has been redefined since that haunting evening. One evening, while I was alone in my place, I sat pondering the events that had transpired. Then it hit me, Perhaps there was some sort of connection with the puzzle box Jasper found. Maybe it was tied to a group or cult responsible for these gruesome acts. The attacker or attackers had to be faceless humans. I picked up my phone and called Jasper, sharing my thoughts and suspicions anonymously. He hesitated for a moment, but agreed that maybe there might be some truth to it. Perhaps it would lead us to an understanding of what we had really faced that fateful night. That moment of realization left a chilling impact on both of us, how vast and unknowable the world could be, and how secrets might be lurking right under our noses, kept hidden by those who wanted them to remain so. Faceless people with vicious intentions, leaving death and devastation in their wake, 
might have been unleashed due to our unwitting meddling with their mysterious object. Ironically, we inadvertently solved one piece of the horrifying puzzle but paid a terrible price in return. Sledgehammer Skirmish from Harding 69 I never thought I'd bear witness to such horror in my life. This happened to me on October 14, 2016. I'm your average working-class guy living a pretty normal life. My job as an accountant pays the bills and affords me a few hobbies and vacations now and then. Back then, I had a small group of friends that I usually hung out with on weekends, attending the occasional house party or just chilling at our favorite pub. Life seemed fairly predictable, and I suppose my biggest flaw was indulging in junk food late at night. One early autumn evening, my friends Beth, Jacob, and I decided to get together for a low-key night at Jacob's apartment. We were chatting idly sipping on some beers, when we abruptly heard several loud banging sounds echoing through the hallways. Initially, we passed it off as a neighbor's rowdy gathering or perhaps someone moving heavy furniture, not uncommon nuisances in our building. However, the noises only intensified over time, accompanied by distressing screams that left us all uneasy. Against our better judgment and fearing for our safety, we didn't alert building security or call the police. We rationalized that it could be an elaborate prank since Halloween was fast approaching. In the days that followed, whispers spread about strange occurrences throughout the building, shattered windows, dismantled doors, and countless grisly sights haunting our neighbors' nightmares. But none of these incidents gave a clear indication of who, or what, was responsible for wreaking all this havoc. Then came the day my life changed forever, or should I say precisely that fateful October 14th night in 2016, I returned home after another exhausting day at work. As I walked down the hallway to my apartment, I noticed something odd wet streaks marking every door leading up to mine. But it wasn't water that was smeared all over. No, it was a thick, dark red substance with an unmistakable coppery scent. Blood. My heart raced in my chest as I carefully pushed open the door, revealing a bloodied sledgehammer lying on my living room floor. Shocked and scared for my life, I frantically called Beth. Jacob, and the police, urging them to come as quickly as possible. And there we were, staring at this gruesome scene. Little did we know that our ordeal was far from over. While we anxiously waited for the police and pondered who could have done such a thing, an unnerving noise came from somewhere behind us, from within one of our apartment's darkened corners. At that moment, something grotesque emerged— a gaunt figure towered over us, its face a twisted mass of wrinkled skin without distinguishing features. As fast as lightning, the faceless terror leaped toward Jacob and swung its long-armed reach around his neck. In a panic, I yelled for Beth and Jacob to run for the door as I grabbed the nearest object, a heavy vase, and threw it at the creature. The vase collided with its body but didn't seem to phase it. Instead, the faceless entity tightened its grip on Jacob's throat. Beth started screaming and desperately tried to pull Jacob out of the creature's grasp. I felt helpless but couldn't bring myself to call for help, fearing that more people would be dragged into this nightmare and end up savagely injured or worse. I decided to take another risk. With my heart pounding in my chest, I leaped towards the creature, managing to grab its arm and yank it away from Jacob's neck. This sudden action seemed to surprise the faceless figure, as it stumbled backward just slightly. 
Beth grabbed my arm and frantically pulled us both toward the door, dragging an almost unconscious Jacob behind us. We stumbled into the hallway and slammed our apartment door shut as we practically fell into our neighbor's arms, who had been alerted by all the commotion. The faceless horror didn't emerge from my apartment, even though all three of us now remained exposed in the hallway. As we waited for police officers to arrive at the scene, we tried explaining our harrowing experience to our terrified neighbors. The police finally arrived and examined my vandalized apartment while taking our statements. They did their best to calm us down but admitted their bafflement about what could have caused such violence, chillingly noting that further investigation would be required. During these days since that fateful encounter, unexplained events still plague our building. Beth and Jacob don't come over anymore. They are understandably traumatized by what happened that night. I've set aside my dependence on junk food for comfort. Sleep is now a luxury none of us ever truly indulge in after seeing that thing. Even now, racking my brain for any possible motive or identification of the antagonist we were confronted with, I remain lost, an anonymous figure with a twisted visage and unexplained violence. Beth would discover later, through desperate research, that similar incidents had happened in other parts of the world with the same unknown, faceless human attackers. The only thing that now binds us together, Beth, Jacob, and me, is the haunting memory of that gruesome night. My Heartless Encounter, from John Sanders 989. To this day, I cannot comprehend what transpired. This happened to me on the 8th of January, 2006. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Allen, a divorced father of two boys who worked as an accountant in a small town in Montana. My life was mundane. Perhaps some would say boring, but it was simple and predictable. On that cold January afternoon, my younger son, Timmy, had urgently called me into the garage. Dad! Dad! You have to see this! He cried out with urgency in his voice. I hesitated before stepping inside the garage, wondering what on earth could be so important. Before I could make sense of it all, I saw bloodstains scattered around the garage floor and walls. It looked like something had taken place there recently, but what exactly? I started to panic. Timmy begged me not to worry and went on to explain the bizarre trail of blood leading to a lifeless hand sticking out behind the parked car. The sight sent ice-cold shivers throughout my body as fear gripped me with an intense force that nearly caused my legs to give out beneath me. Call the police, I whispered hastily, trembling under my breath. In mere minutes, we were surrounded by blue and red flashing lights, accompanied by a cacophony of sirens. An eerie silence followed, only interrupted by the occasional radio chatter of the officers that swarmed our home. After a tiresome interrogation session with law enforcement that lasted well into the night, they left us in peace with more questions than answers and advised us to stay vigilant and report any suspicious activity immediately. Life tended to move fast after that incident. My sons began going to therapy sessions as we all insisted on giving a semblance of normalcy, or at least tried our best. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, life started to regain some semblance of its former self. My closest friends would warn me about the shadowy figures in the surrounding areas of the town, but nothing matched what we experienced that day. One rainy Tuesday, not long after the police investigation had closed, 
I would come across another chilling display on my way back from lunch with a close friend. Pinned against my front door were what appeared to be small animal intestine pieces, intricately designed to form a horrific mask-like shape. Over subsequent days, events escalated like an assault plan to stretch us dangerously thin with panic. I witnessed skinned animals hanging from trees during my morning jog or found them under my dining room table when we returned home from Timmy's soccer match. It was as if an invisible evil had haunted our every step, expertly avoiding detection and yet exhibiting its misdeeds. I no longer felt safe. Neither did my children, poor things. One fog-stricken morning, Another gruesome portrait invaded our lives. Glossy-eyed somehow stark naked, standing mere inches from our living room window as we prepared breakfast. I took one look at their unrecognizable faces and felt a surge of nauseous dread overwhelm me at this cruel torment inflicted upon my family. This sinister stranger never ceased his torture— stalking with malicious intent and expert covert manipulation of his prey, me and those dear to me. And then it came down to that fateful February night when it all hit the proverbial fan. The unexpected knock at our door interrupted the quiet tranquility of my home. As dinner simmered on the stove, my itching curiosity begged me to open that door and face our demon head-on. I opened the door without hesitation and was greeted by darkness, darker than one could expect on a moonless winter night. Hello? I nervously called out into this abyss, devoid of response or acknowledgement. Pure silence echoed back, then suddenly, the door slammed on its hinges with a force strong enough to rattle the framed family pictures lining our corridor. From the corner of my eye, I caught a fleeting glimpse of the nightmare that would make our lives a living hell. The antagonist stalked just beyond my sight lines, unleashing an unearthly rage to wreak havoc on every aspect of our existence. Deathly shrieks flew out from every direction, more animal intestines plastered onto walls and windows. Seemingly, a different message seemed encrypted for each incomprehensible scene. I called the police to report the naked figure by my window and the animal remains that continued to plague us. The officers arrived, but they found no trace of the intruder. They collected the gruesome evidence from our property, but it didn't seem like they had any leads. They advised us to lock our doors and windows and stay vigilant. Then they left leaving us with increasing fear and paranoia. The days grew short as winter began to set in, and my family felt altogether claustrophobic inside our once safe home. I made sure our windows remained locked, and I bought security cameras to install all around the house. It wasn't enough. Our neighbors started reporting sightings of strange silhouettes running around town. People claimed their pets would vanish, only to find them tortured or dismembered hours later. This twisted game ensued with no apparent end in sight. Tired of feeling helpless, I installed an alarm system in my home. Although this measure seemed futile against our faceless adversary, it was a small assurance that eased my family's restless minds. We were becoming wary of everyone we encountered, not knowing if a fleeting smile or friendly conversation masked malicious intentions. We even stopped accepting visitors for fear that letting them in would invite disaster into our midst. Then one evening, it all came to a boiling point. The alarm went off while we were having dinner, a loud calamity shattering our fragile attempt at normalcy. We scrambled out of the house under a piercing symphony of blaring sirens. Outside, we saw blood smeared across our front porch and graffiti on the walls bearing unrecognizable symbols in black paint. I noticed my neighbors stepping out of their houses too, 
with terror etched on their faces, as they witnessed our family's distress unfold in real time. The alarm continued to blare relentlessly as police sirens approached from a distance, sirens that would prove utterly useless in their futile attempts to apprehend the ruthless tormentor. The police found no one. Their investigation would prove fruitless with not even a single clue, leaving them as stumped as they were from the moment they set foot on my property weeks earlier. Days later, several other families reported being attacked in the same manner. With each new assault, the rituals became more elaborate, and the symbols grew increasingly detailed, as if they were taunting us with an indecipherable code. Unnerved by these unyielding attacks, a neighbor organized a town meeting to discuss what little could be done to stop these atrocities. We debated long into the night but eventually agreed on one thing. We felt abandoned by authorities whose job it was to protect us. Our evenings became sleepless and intertwined with fear and hopelessness for both ourselves and our community. Rumors speculated that this might be the work of someone from the town itself, someone faceless among us. Our mutual trust slowly disintegrated while suspicion festered like a silent poison, destroying any sense of safety we once had. As I lay awake one night, tossing and turning in the candlelit silence, curating images of gruesome scenes within my muddled thoughts, I heard a slight noise outside. The wind whistled through the trees, but my mind accentuated each twig snapping and rustle of leaves into a cacophony of potential threats lurking outside my window. And just when I thought that things couldn't get any worse, in that moment of heightened alertness and crippling anxiety, I suddenly remembered reading about a local cult active years ago, whose members believed themselves prophets in a theater of silent terror sowing fear and discord through cruel acts to appease their faceless god. They had never been caught, instead vanishing amongst us, faceless among the faceless people. The Dark Smiles of Riverbridge From Bob Larson, 88 I never thought my life would take such a twisted turn. This happened to me on September 15, 2005. I've always been an average guy, a software developer, with a loving wife and a couple of close friends. I had my quirks. I wasn't perfect, but who among us is? One of my vices was a penchant for late-night fast food runs. These late-night cravings would often lead me down winding roads and into unusual locales to get my hands on some greasy goodness. On that fateful September night, I left my home to fetch some grub from the nearest fast-food joint. It was a warm evening in the peaceful town of Riverbridge, situated in the Midwest. The streets were eerily quiet as I drove through them with only a few porch lights illuminating the otherwise dark streets. I arrived at my destination, an old-looking burger joint known for its supposedly secret sauce. After ordering my food and exchanging some simple banter with the man behind the counter, I sat down by the window to wait for my order. Suddenly, outside the restaurant's large windows, an uncomfortable scene unfolded before me. A man lay on the sidewalk, mutilated beyond recognition. His face seemed to melt away, as if acid had been poured on it. Horror clenched at my chest as I stared at this gruesome sight. I jumped to my feet and rushed to the door as others in the restaurant remained frozen in fear. The air outside was heavy with an electric tension that turned one's stomach into knots. I could see no trace of anything, or anyone, that could have inflicted such monstrous injuries on this poor soul. With no other choice but to call for help, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. When asked what had happened, 
I couldn't help but shudder as I relayed the gruesome discovery. The dispatcher's voice came through my phone, promising to send someone right away. We were told to stay inside the restaurant until the police arrived. There was an uneasy silence among us, interrupted only by occasional whispers between those who knew each other. I couldn't help but feel that we were all thinking the same thing. Was this some sort of deranged serial killer, or something much worse? After what felt like an eternity, the sirens finally rang out as squad cars and paramedics arrived at the scene. Uniformed officers cautiously approached the man's body, weapons held close to their chests. Their expressions maneuvered between bewilderment and terror as they encircled the body. The conversations among us inside grew more animated as our hunger for answers intensified alongside our deepening fear. Yet even with the presence of law enforcement and medical professionals, no one seemed to have any clue what had happened. Minutes stretched into hours as we were kept inside for questioning. The police asked about anything suspicious or unusual we had witnessed before or during our time in the restaurant. Of course, none of us had seen anything remotely helpful. Eventually, after providing all the information I could, I was allowed to leave alongside my fellow late-night eaters. The drive home was filled with anxious glances in my rearview mirror and a pounding heart that refused to calm down. The news spread throughout Riverbridge like wildfire. Everyone was talking about it. Neighbors chattered in hushed voices across picket fences. Talk radio hosts turned their discussions toward gruesome speculations. And grocery store gossipers shared wild theories about cults and deranged psychopaths. The following days were filled with continued occurrences of these horrifying attacks around town one at a playground, another in a suburban backyard, even one inside someone's bedroom. Each act seemed more sinister than the last, with victims left disfigured and agonized by the unthinkable events. Long past my initial late-night encounter, the town remains plagued by these atrocities. No one has been able to uncover any leads or identify the horrific person responsible for the terror that pervades Riverbridge. Panic has taken over as residents contemplate the twisted possibilities that appear in our nightmares. The police presence in Riverbridge increased dramatically following the gruesome attacks. People began to avoid going out after dark and started to take security measures in their homes. The local authorities urged everyone to remain vigilant, as they seemed just as baffled by the faceless assailant as the rest of the town. I decided to change my daily routine and tried to stay out of harm's way as much as possible. I started coming home directly after work and didn't go to any restaurants or bars, lest I stumble upon another terrifying scene. One evening, while walking home from the grocery store, I noticed a group of people gathered around something in a nearby alley. The fear that gripped Riverbridge made it impossible for me not to investigate. As I cautiously approached, the chilling sight of another mutilated body came into view. Bile rose in my throat, and I quickly turned away from the gruesome scene. Among the horrified onlookers, I caught the eye of a woman who seemed strangely calm amidst the chaos. She looked familiar, perhaps another survivor from that first fateful night at the restaurant. As she caught my gaze, she signaled for me to follow her into another alleyway where we could speak privately. Reluctantly, I followed her, desperate for any information that could shed light on these horrifying events. I've seen them. She whispered, glancing back towards the group we'd left behind. I don't know who they are or how many there are of them, but they're faceless humans. My heart raced at her revelation, but the practical part of me remained skeptical. Why haven't you told the police? I questioned. 
because they wouldn't believe me, she replied grimly. I tried once. They thought I was delusional. What can we do then? I asked urgently. All we can do is warn people, she said with resignation in her voice. Tell them to be cautious and not to be alone, especially after dark. Hopefully, that'll be enough until the police find something more concrete. After exchanging contact information, we went our separate ways. The weight of her words hung heavily on my mind, and I began spreading the warning about these faceless humans as discreetly as possible. As the days went on, more incidents occurred throughout Riverbridge, yet not one person managed to get a clear look at their attacker. People became paranoid, friendships strained, and families fought to stay united in the face of this ever-growing terror. On my way home from work one night, I noticed an individual cloaked in a hood at the end of a dimly lit street. My pulse quickened, but instead of succumbing to fear or allowing panic to set in, anger began boiling inside me. While others retreated to their homes in secrecy and solitude, too afraid to face the nightmare that had gripped our town, I decided to confront it head-on. In that defiant moment, I made a silent vow. If these faceless humans sought to terrorize us, I would not cower any longer. I sprinted towards the hooded figure with reckless abandon, screaming loudly and waving my arms threateningly. As I approached, the figure stumbled back and then haphazardly crawled up a nearby tree with unnatural speed. Catching my breath under the tree where the mysterious figure had sought refuge, I shook with fear but felt unyielding determination take hold. I called out to it. You can't hide from us forever. We'll find out who you are. The figure crouched silently above me in the branches of the tree, their features obscured by darkness. All at once, it leaped from branch to branch between trees and disappeared into the night. As my adrenaline subsided and reality settled in once more, all that was left was the eerie silence of a terrorized town, paralyzed by a group of faceless people hell-bent on destruction. The Peculiar Disappearance of Rachel, from Dove Blue 34 I still can't believe it. This happened to me on October 19, 2007. My name is Max Whitaker, a former website designer with a rather unhealthy addiction to coffee. Rachel made up for it by being a kind of free-spirited whirlwind, full of life and laughter, while working at the advertising agency in Atlanta, Georgia. A trivia night at the local pub brought together our mediocre minds and endless wisecracks. The day took an unusual turn when we decided to visit Middle George's little-known haunted house. A stylistic mix of Gothic and Victorian architecture stood against the creeping vines and overgrown foliage that seemed determined to reclaim it. We had chuckled about the silly whispers that came out because, let's be honest, Nobody really believes in faceless men unless they're too deep into Stephen King. Approaching the ominous residence with our friend Tim, we entered through the creaking gate. Its rusted hinges sent my heart racing faster than any caffeine jolt ever did. We stepped inside. The broken floorboards croaked under our feet. The thick scent of early autumn hung heavy among the looming shadows, though no sunlight could penetrate these dusty halls. Rachel insisted on examining every inch of that musty old mansion as if scavenging for a precious trinket. Tim, always resourceful in the practical jokes department, called out dramatically for restless spirits. After exploring for what felt like hours in a silent game of hide-and-seek, I yawned and checked my watch and that was when things took a sinister turn. At precisely 5.33 p.m. on October 19th, 
Rachel wandered off into one of the rooms and never came back out. Tim and I searched for her with growing dread. Either humor nor sarcasm offered comfort in this oppressive atmosphere anymore. Our voices echoed eerily through the house, a futile quest to find our missing friend. Hours later, we discovered a locked basement door, one that hadn't been there previously. Logic screamed at me that it was impossible, yet my hands shook uncontrollably as I reached out. Something about that door seemed to hold the answers and horrors of an unspeakable truth. With inexplicable fear coiling tightly around my chest, we forced the lock and descended the rapidly darkening stairs. A pervasive scent of decay assaulted us as soon as we set foot down there. In the dim light from Tim's cell phone, we recognized numerous scratches on the walls. Someone had frantically tried to claw their way out, the desperation palpable. In this underworld haze, we stumbled upon putrid remains and mangled clothing telltales of grisly fates that felt like a warning from the stuff of nightmares. I clenched my teeth and forced our legs to keep moving. Somewhere in all this carnage had to be Rachel. Then came the moment that shattered everything I knew about reality. Tim vanished. One heartbeat before he stood there beside me, cold hands shaking in terror. The next heartbeat. Only darkness and another agonizing emptiness remained. We had heard nothing more alarming than our shaky breathing, but suddenly I found myself entirely alone in this crepuscular underworld. Words were beyond me now. I felt icy hot flashes race up and down my spine as panic threatened to decimate what self-control remained. My heartbeat pounded loudly while bony fingers clutched at the air, seeking some invisible anchor amid this nightmare. Then all the remaining light vanished completely. The suffocating darkness wrapped itself around me like a malevolent force intent on drawing me into an inescapable abyss. Despite every instinct screaming at me to run, I realized there was nowhere left to escape. I couldn't leave Rachel and Tim behind. In that darkness, I tried to retrace my steps towards the entrance. Each step increased my desperation, and the feeling of watching eyes grew stronger. As I navigated the maze-like basement, I stumbled upon a room where my friends were bound, gagged, and barely conscious. Quickly, I untied Rachel and Tim, and we rushed toward the stairs. At that moment, we heard footsteps from above, causing us to freeze in place. Afraid to make any sound or call for help, it felt like our only chance to escape was by evading whoever or whatever was in the house with us. Slowly and cautiously, we ascended the stairs. Once back on the main floor, we tiptoed through the dusty halls, seeking an exit. As we passed a window, a light shone outside. A car was approaching. Risking discovery, I waved at it. Despite my fears of being heard or seen by our captor, I knew this might be our only chance to get help. Fortunately for us, the car stopped before turning around and leaving. The driver must have noticed our distress because shortly afterward, sirens rang in the distance as police cars approached. Relieved but still cautious in case we had been discovered inside this sinister house, we waited anxiously for backup. Once they arrived and secured the area, officers stormed into the mansion. What they discovered shocked everyone present, a group of cloaked figures awaiting them in a hidden room. Unmasked and in disbelief themselves over getting caught so easily by mere luck on our part, these faceless men explained their twisted motive behind all these gruesome traps and bodies merely entertainment for their perverse club members who reveled in watching victims struggle to survive. They were charged with multiple counts of kidnapping and murder as evidence piled up against them.
the victims' families mourn their losses while thanking us for inadvertently putting an end to those horrors and bringing justice. In the aftermath of its discovery, the decrepit mansion stood as a chilling reminder of the terrors deep within those walls. And most horrifyingly, we never truly learned how many more were involved or if they would ever capture all of those faceless people. Murderous Whispers from Jack Brown 77 I thought moving to a small, quiet town would bring peace and tranquility to my life. This happened to me on the 23rd of October, 2017. Before all of this, I had a simple life as an accountant, crunching numbers and making ends meet. I have a loving wife, Karen, and two beautiful kids, Lily and Jake, who mean the world to me. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I have too much to drink with my buddies on a Friday night or let my temper get the best of me over inconsequential matters. Everything changed the day we moved into our new home. It was an eerie incident that set off a chain of events I could never have imagined in my worst nightmares. As we unpacked our belongings that first night, Karen had taken Lily and Jake to pick up some dinner. It was getting late, so they left their bikes on the lawn near the hedgerows. The next morning, we found the bikes mangled and crushed beyond recognition. The twisted metal frame had been warped in every direction. It looked like it had been put through a shredder. None of us could understand how this had happened. Days went by and we tried to put that incident behind us. We would occasionally find things out of place, like our mailbox smashed and a dead bird on our porch, but we all just assumed it was some kids causing trouble in the neighborhood. One night, as I stood by my kitchen window having a late-night snack, I noticed something peculiar just at the edge of my yard. Heavy footsteps leading away from our shed toward the woods at the end of our property line. They appeared fresh, as if someone or something had been there just moments before. I decided it was time to call the cops. This had gone too far. As Officer James arrived at our house and inspected those strange footprints, he casually mentioned a few similar incidents occurring around town. There were rumors of some sort of supernatural presence, perhaps a cult masquerading as a person or group. The following week, our quiet neighborhood was shaken to its core. Our next-door neighbor, Mrs. Johnson, was found murdered in her home. The details of her death were too gruesome to describe here, but suffice it to say, it chilled me to the bone. It became increasingly clear that we were dealing with something far beyond mere vandalism and petty crime. My family and I began to fear for our lives, knowing full well that whatever malevolent force had brutally killed Mrs. Johnson could have its sights set on us next. All the while, the police continued to patrol the streets and search for clues regarding the mysterious attacker. Things went from bad to worse after another victim was discovered, a jogger found mutilated in the woods near our house. Panic rippled through our once peaceful community. People began to whisper theories about the faceless criminals stalking our town. I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to protect my family in this nightmare unfolding before us. With my heart pounding in my chest, I purchased a shotgun and spent hours every night studying our property, looking for any sign of an intruder. As time went on and more victims fell prey to this unknown antagonist, hope began fading away with each new day. As I sat with my family once again, tears streamed down Karen's face as she feared for what might befall our children. That same night, not wanting our kids to be left alone in their rooms anymore, we let them sleep in our bedroom while Karen and I took turns keeping watch downstairs. 
As midnight approached, Karen slipped upstairs while I sat on edge in the living room. Suddenly, a glass shattered somewhere in the darkness. Adrenaline coursed through me as I grabbed my shotgun and listened for any sign of the faceless horror terrorizing our lives. I carefully inched toward the source of the noise, shotgun in hand. As I approached the kitchen, I noticed shards of broken glass on the floor beneath the window. The window had been smashed from the outside, leaving a sizable hole. I swiftly checked around for any signs of an intruder but found nothing. Knowing I couldn't handle this situation on my own, I called Officer James for help. He arrived within minutes, and we both examined the shattered window. It was apparent that whoever was responsible had fled by the time I reached the scene. Officer James decided to call for backup. This was no longer a matter any single officer could handle on their own. We waited tensely as additional squad cars arrived. As more officers joined us, we explained what we knew so far about the earlier incidents and Mrs. Johnson's murder. Together with local law enforcement, we took turns patrolling the outer perimeter of our house and keeping an eye out for any activity near our property line and inside our home. During one of these shifts, Officer James received a call about another body discovered in a nearby alleyway. This time, it was a young woman who had met a similar gruesome fate as Mrs. Johnson. As everyone tried to piece together what could be happening and who was behind it all, searching for a pattern or motive, we could only come up with one chilling possibility, a faceless group of people perpetrating these horrible acts throughout our town. Our lives were filled with perpetual fear and paranoia as more bodies surfaced over the next few days, friends, neighbors, and strangers alike brutally murdered by this unknown antagonist. On what would turn out to be the final day before our lives were forever changed, I spotted someone lurking in our backyard, their menacing presence undeniable even from my vantage point inside the house. With no time to think, I aimed my shotgun carefully at the figure and fired a shot, forcing them to flee into the woods. The police were alerted, and they quickly secured the area. A search began for any trace of the faceless terror ravishing our town. As hours turned into days, the community was on high alert. The police interrogated potential suspects and conducted thorough searches throughout the town, trying to put an end to this nightmare. We bolstered security at our home and remained vigilant. It was during a rainy night that I finally learned the harrowing truth. A barely coherent survivor managed to escape from one of these faceless people and reveal critical information regarding their origin. Their story spoke of individuals who sought power by engaging in diabolical acts. This group of mass sociopaths would later become known as the Faceless Ones. Unfortunately, despite all efforts made by law enforcement and everyone affected in our once peaceful community, we never found or apprehended those responsible for the gruesome deaths that plagued our town. Knowing that every member of the Faceless Ones still walks amongst us sends a shiver down my spine. Wondering what could have drawn these seemingly ordinary people to commit such unspeakable horrors haunts me every single day. The Haunting Witness, from Jefferson 21091 I've always been quite a skeptic when it came to paranormal events or strange occurrences. This happened to me on July 17, 2009. At that time, I was working as a bartender in a small pub located in Eureka, California. The pub was situated right by the harbor, which meant that, Despite having its fair share of regulars, we also attracted a lot of boat workers and occasional tourists. 
As far as family life went, I had just gotten through a messy breakup and was trying my best to put my life back together. A few evenings after my late shift at the pub ended, I stumbled across some scratchy graffiti scrawled on an alley's wall as I walked back home. It wasn't anything impressive or unusual, just the words. Beware the faceless. Accompanied by what appeared to be a hastily drawn face with blank spaces where eyes, nose, and mouth should have been. Over the course of several weeks, odd incidents began to occur around the pub and surrounding area. Animals were found mutilated in inexplicable ways, limbs severed and organs removed with surgical precision. Patrons shared chilled whispers of something lurking in shadows just beyond their peripheral vision, but disappearing when they tried getting a better look. I found myself joking with customers about our mutual relief to have witnessed these grisly sights only secondhand, yet deep down, I couldn't help but feel shaken up about it all. One evening I met up with my friend Mike at the bar after work for a drink and some casual conversation. As we sat there chatting about recent events, Mike mentioned having seen the same graffiti that caught my interest weeks prior. Beware the faceless. We laughed nervously about it but couldn't help wondering who would write such an ominous message. Eventually, unable to resist our curiosity, we decided to walk back alleyways near the harbor, searching for more signs of the mysterious. Faceless. What started as a light-hearted adventure quickly turned dark as we discovered more gruesome displays. We came across an overturned dumpster, its contents strewn about across the alley floor. Amid the mess were even more grotesque sights, human limbs, some torn from bodies and others meticulously arranged in bizarre patterns. I struggled to suppress my bubbly breakfast as Mike reported the grisly scene to the police. We could hardly contain our fear while waiting for them to arrive. The investigation that followed only raised more questions than it answered. No one seemed to know where the gruesome body parts originated, or even how they had wound up in the dumpster. During this time, I kept a wary eye on my surroundings while walking or driving home after working late at the pub. I wasn't about to let these strange occurrences intimidate me, but their unsettling nature was impossible to ignore. One night, as I walked back home through dimly lit streets and deserted alleys, I heard echoing footsteps following me from a distance. As they grew louder, closer, and almost in sync with my own pace, I felt my pulse quicken with each beat of my heart. It was then that I witnessed something horrifying. On turning around a corner, I met with an indescribable sight, a very tall figure lined against the facade of a building that had no face. It looked like a shadow, its body changing with the wind like smoke. I wanted desperately to look away to pretend that what I saw wasn't real, but my eyes were glued to the faceless figure as it slowly crept towards me. Legs shaking uncontrollably beneath me, I tried willing myself into action, anything but standing paralyzed before this monstrous phantom. Unable to stand any longer, I crumbled under the weight of terror that overwhelmed me. And just when it seemed that all hope was lost, a pair of high-intensity beams cut through the night and illuminated the indistinguishable figure. The high-intensity beams belonged to a police car that had pulled up nearby, responding to a report of suspicious activity in the area. The officers got out of the car and quickly scanned their surroundings, and the faceless figure vanished as if it had never been there. Relieved but still shaken from the encounter, I approached the officers and explained what I had witnessed. They listened intently but offered little comment on the matter. Unsure of whether to feel comforted or further alarmed by their silence, I decided to simply head home. Over the next few days, 
rumors of faceless attackers circulated throughout our town. More people were reportedly injured or found dead in secluded urban corners, though none could provide any concrete information about their assailants. Panic began to set in. Everywhere I went, conversations carried hushed tones of apprehension. My boss at the pub noticed my uneasiness and started closing early as a precautionary measure. We encouraged patrons to leave early, before dark, so they could make it home safely. These new measures did little to relieve my growing anxiety, however. The following evening, after locking up the pub early again, I felt that same unsettling feeling of being followed on my way home. My mind raced as unwanted images of bloodied alleys and faceless horrors played on repeat in my thoughts. Determined not to let fear paralyze me again, I took out my phone, ready to call for help if needed. As I hurried through an alley shortcut towards my apartment building, a piercing scream echoed through the night air. The sound was too close for comfort as I realized it was just opposite the entrance to my building. My heart pounded in my chest as thoughts of previous horrors filled my mind. Despite overwhelming fear, I understood that help was needed urgently. Dialing 911 as fast as possible, I reported the scream and gave them my location. Wasting no time, Sirens already sounded in the distance as I cautiously approached where the scream had come from. There, in the dimly lit street corner, a victim lay on the ground, bleeding profusely. I desperately tried to help, using my shirt to apply pressure to the wound. To my relief, emergency responders arrived swiftly. They provided immediate medical assistance, and thankfully, the injured person regained consciousness. While waiting for the police to arrive, the victim shared a chilling piece of information with me and the paramedics. They struggled to describe their attacker but managed to convey an almost unbelievable aspect. It had no face. The police took our statements, including mine from my previous unsettling encounter, but there was not much they could do without new leads. The question of what was lurking in the shadows remained unanswered, spreading even more fear through our town. A few days later, chilling graffiti started to appear on walls all over town. Beware the faceless. Some claimed that these faceless creatures were born out of those mutilated corpses found in alleyways, once innocent people turned into monstrous beings by some unknown force. Others believed them to be a secret society, or a strange cult that struck when they had one of us alone. Despite endless speculations and violent incidents continuing to plague our town, despite authorities working tirelessly around the clock, despite sleepless nights and constant fear-driven conversations, no one truly solved the enigma of these faceless beings wreaking havoc on our lives. Maybe one day we will discover their true origin, how they came to terrorize and destroy our once peaceful community. For now, though, we are left only with whispers, glimpses of nightmares in dark corners, and an unshakable sense of fear from unknown sources. None would dare say anything about it, but somehow, instinctively, we all knew that these faceless humans were among us. My Encounter with the Faceless Terror From John Doe 47 I can't believe that happened. This happened to me on October 21, 2017. I was an ordinary guy working as a bartender in a small town called Crestview, Florida. My family often nags about my drinking habit and laziness towards life. So... I had my fair share of problems and complaints. Living a mundane life, 
I never expected something so spine-chilling and bone-quaking could actually happen to me. During my weekly day off from the bar, I decided to take a walk through the nearby park. Although it was my usual stroll route, that day I felt an eerie silence enveloping me, as if another force were present around me. My uneasiness grew with each step. I couldn't see anything unusual around me, but there was definitely a sense of impending doom sneaking up behind me. That's when I saw it, a gruesome and grotesque scene that could chill anyone's blood. In the middle of the park, there was a huge wooden statue. It appeared fairly new. The thing that horrified me most was that someone had carved it to appear as if it were feasting upon human limbs. Realistic-looking arms and legs were scattered around the statue as if it had been interrupted during its deadly meal. At first glance, I thought it was just some sick prank by local hoodlums, but when I moved closer to inspect the scene, it only got worse. It became clear that those limbs were not fake. They were real human remains sprawled chaotically on the ground around the statue. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I whispered to myself in disbelief and shock as goosebumps crawled up my skin. At that precise moment, a woman walking her dog entered the scene. Her dog started barking frantically upon noticing the macabre display. Someone, call the police! She shrieked upon seeing the horror in front of her eyes. I'll call them now. I replied, grabbing my phone from my pocket. My hands were shaky when I dialed 911, and I reported what we had discovered at the park. The dispatcher asked us to stay put while they sent officers to the scene. The macabre sight was unnerving, so the woman and I moved a little further away from it, but not too far that we couldn't see what was happening. Our growing fear filled the air with thick tension. That's when it happened, right in front of our eyes, something inexplicable took place on that statue. From within its cracks and crevices, a shadowy outline of a face began to take form, an eerie and almost transcendental moment, as if some faceless entity were trying to embody itself within the statue. The woman screamed in terror at this supernatural phenomenon. I was scared out of my wits but I felt somehow rooted in place, as if compelled to witness this manifestation unfold before me. Suddenly, the face broke free from the statue's confines. Its hollow eyes bore into us. This ungodly manifestation threatened to dominate our psyche forever. Run! I yelled as we bolted in opposite directions from the faceless terror seeking escape from its rapidly expanding influence. As I sprinted back towards town, I could sense it right behind me, a villainous force vying for our lives like prey. It seemed to annihilate every obstacle in its path, sending shudders through me as I struggled to keep ahead of it. As the woman and I continued to run, desperate to escape, I heard the terrifying sounds of chaos erupting in the park. People were screaming as they encountered the gruesome scene and the malevolent entity causing havoc. We had no choice but to call for help, so we yelled out to anyone we could see. Passers-by joined us, desperately trying to outrun whatever it was that was tormenting us. We all ran together, hearts pounding, knowing that our very lives depended on fleeing this indescribable horror. Even though there were now more people around us, none of us stopped running. Our breaths came in short, panicked gasps as we haphazardly navigated the streets of our town. All around us, bystanders stared in confusion and terror at the pandemonium unfolding before their eyes. As we caught a brief momentary glimpse behind us, it became apparent that the faceless force had grown stronger and more aggressive. Limbs seemed to materialize from its body, forcibly dragging people into its dark embrace, leaving agonized screams echoing through the air. 
The capes around us only intensified as everyone scrambled for shelter or a place to hide from this relentless abomination. It felt like a war zone, with no place safe from its influence. I turned to one of the passers-by next to me and called out, We need to find a place to hide. Quickly! He nodded his agreement, guiding our group into an abandoned building nearby. The group huddled together inside a barricaded room, praying we had distanced ourselves enough from the entity outside. Horrifying sounds frequented our ears, an auditory manifestation of utter terror taking place outside our hiding spot. The police arrived soon after, countless sirens wailing through the streets in response to the chaotic scene, but their efforts had little effect on stopping or containing this force. We knew rescue was unlikely as we remained hidden in that small barricaded room, an overwhelming dread consuming us all. As we sat there, I contemplated whether this was all someone's twisted idea of a sick joke, someone maliciously preying on our fears. The thought of other humans being responsible for this carnage was disquieting, but strangely numbing. Hours later, the sounds outside had gradually diminished as we wondered if the danger had passed and it was safe to leave our hiding spot. We braced for the worst as we cautiously opened the barricade, allowing sunlight to flood into the room. Emerging from our concealment, we observed the aftermath of the horrifying event. Countless victims lay lifeless in the streets, with more injured desperately clinging to survival while being tended to by those who escaped unharmed. The faceless entity left carnage in its wake, seemingly leaving no trace of its existence. The horror that took place that day refused to be forgotten as people searched for answers in the following weeks. A profound sadness lay heavy in the town as each victim became a painful reminder of what occurred. On one of those sleepless nights, as I lay in bed racked with regret, I pieced together fragments, forming an unnerving realization. The statue could not have been placed there on its own. A group must be behind it all, a group so twisted they would use faceless humans to perpetrate this gruesome horror on innocent lives simply for their own dark agenda. Urban Atrocity, from Kaja 2345 I was waiting for my laundry at the nearby laundromat. This happened to me on October 3rd, 2012. As a freelance graphic designer working from home, my routine life had become monotonous. I lived in Queens in a modest apartment with my dog, Rosie. The new order of things after my divorce weighed down on me. Laptop in hand, I decided to get out of the house and complete some job assignments from the laundromat to distract myself while waiting for my laundry. The laundromat's fluorescent lights flickered above me as I sat and did my work on one of their tables. After an exhausting era of designing, I decided to grab a snack from a vending machine. As the machine buzzed and juddered in its effort to dispense my snack, I caught a glimpse of an odd sight outside the storefront window, fresh blood smeared across one of the parked cars. The gruesome sight gave me pause and took away any feeling of hunger that remained. Despite being concerned that I shouldn't interfere with anything suspicious or dangerous, curiosity got the better of me. After all, what if someone was hurt? Navigating around washers and dryers in various states of use, I hesitantly approached the door and stepped outside. Shutting the door behind me, it seemed like any normal evening on the streets of Queens, except for what appeared to be fresh scratches accompanied by long streaks of blood on one vehicle parked outside. Following these unsettling clues led me down an eerily dark alley. No sooner had I taken only a few steps further when I saw her, 
a woman slumped against a dumpster, her eyes wide open with terror. Her shredded clothes were soaked with crimson-colored tears as she was helplessly gasping through her pain. In delirium, she reached out a shaky hand towards me, imploring me desperately for help. Panicked, I rushed to her side and tried my best to calm her down. Not knowing what else to do, I asked her who had harmed her and how it happened, only to be met with a string of almost unintelligible descriptions. From what she was able to tell me between gurgling breaths, the attacker had been completely faceless, literally. That is when we heard the sound of approaching footsteps echoing through the alley behind me. Realizing how dire the situation was becoming, I warned her not to make a sound and called 911. As I explained the horrific scene to the police dispatcher, a shadow emerged from around the corner. The group was faceless. Their ill intent was palpable as they approached us with the intent of violence. Speaking in discordant unison, she says, Why did you call them? I stared in disbelief at these faceless monsters, fear and disgust boiling within me. Finding strength through anger, I decided to protect this poor woman with every ounce of energy I had left. Picking up a metal rod from the ground, I stood defensively in front of her while trying my best to stall for time, our lives hanging on by a thread. As the faceless group advanced toward us, I glanced around. Spotting a fire escape above, I grabbed the injured woman and helped her stand. With the metal rod clutched in my hand and my other arm supporting the woman, we slowly limped our way toward the fire escape. The faceless entities picked up their pace, closing in on us. Determined not to let them get any closer, I swung the metal rod wildly in their direction to keep them at bay. They hesitated for a moment, which gave us just enough time to reach the fire escape ladder. Struggling with her injury, I assisted the woman up the ladder as quickly as we could manage. But it seemed like every time we made some progress, our pursuers were always just a step behind. Fearful that they would catch us, we continued to climb towards the rooftop, desperate for any chance of escape. Once on top of the building, I scanned my surroundings for a possible path to safety. The police sirens wailed in the distance. They were only moments away from arriving at our location. Holding the woman tighter against me, I ran to the edge of the roof, where another building stood close by. Miss, I said urgently, I need you to hold on to me tightly. We need to jump across. She nodded weakly as she clung to me for dear life. With one deep breath and using all the strength I could muster, I leaped across to the other building with her in my arms. The impact of landing jarred my bones, but I managed to hold on to her regardless. Looking back in horror and disbelief at where we came from, the streets below me were swarmed by police officers and flashing blue lights illuminated behind them. The faceless group retreated into shadows, occasionally making their presence known with unsettling whispers. As sirens closed in on them, fading into the darkness, the night fell silent again. Hearing the woman softly moan in pain, I refocused on her. Hang in there, I reassured her. We're safe now, and help is here. As the police swept through the area, I tended to the injured woman's wounds as best as I could. A police officer finally found us on the rooftop and called for medical assistance. The paramedics were quick to act, attending to her on site before placing her gently on a stretcher. Thank you, she whispered faintly as they made their way towards an awaiting ambulance. As the officers took my statement and briefed me on their arrival circumstances, dread surged through me like electricity. 
The faceless group that had attacked us was reportedly wanted for similar attacks on other innocent victims in recent weeks. I shuddered at the thought of how close we came to experiencing the same awful fate. They were faceless humans, a small yet terrifying group whose motivations remained unclear. Their only constant was the trail of gore and broken lives left in their wake. Unbeknownst to me, I stumbled into their night terror and joined their list of hunted victims, following only instinct in that alley. Little did I know that these blood-hungry namesakes had been hiding in plain sight within our very community. Although what they sought remains unclear, their dreadful impact cannot be overstated. Suspicious Sounds from John Smith 1920 I've never encountered something so unnerving in my life. This happened to me on August 25, 2016. My name is John Smith, and I'm a 32-year-old computer programmer living in a small town in Pennsylvania. I have a loving wife, two supportive friends from college, and a dog named Ace. We all reside in this three-bedroom house on the outskirts of town, near the edge of a dense forest. If I can be honest, I've never been much of a people person, preferring to spend my free time buried in books or tinkering with the latest gadgets. My wife, Madeline, claims it's part of my charm, as long as I still remember to take out the trash. One evening after dinner, as I was entering our garage to grab some tools for fixing my lawnmower, I noticed an unusual noise coming from behind the bushes near our property line. It sounded like an odd humming, almost resembling muffled human voices. Baffled and intrigued, I stepped back inside and informed Madeline about the strange sounds. My friend Mark had just stopped by with his girlfriend Ellen for an impromptu game night so I caught their attention as well and asked if they wanted to have a quick look at the situation before resuming our board game war. They agreed without hesitation. Armed with flashlights and limitless curiosity, we stepped into the night air and approached the bushes where the noise was emanating from. As we got closer to its source amidst the rustling leaves, the uncanny humming became increasingly disturbing. It seemed like every inch toward it heightened our nervousness. The moment we were mere steps from those darkened bushes, something horrific unfolded. We witnessed mangled body parts being dragged into view from various corners of our property by an unseen force or entity. The gruesome appendages smoothly glided to a central point, as if decided by intelligent purpose. Panic surged through our veins as the terrifying spectacle was beyond comprehension. Without waiting a second longer, Mark whipped out his phone and dialed 911. His voice trembled as he explained our horrific discovery to the operator. We could only watch in wide-eyed terror as severed arms and legs meshed together grotesquely and nodded into one squirming monstrosity. Help is on its way! Mark announced after ending the call, but relief was held at bay when we noticed the dark silhouette of someone or something lurking just beyond the disfigured mass within those bushes. Though we couldn't make out specific facial features, it was apparent that this figure was tall, unnaturally thin, and most certainly observing us. Desperate to protect ourselves and by some time until help arrived, Mark yelled obscenities at the looming figure while ripping branches from bushes around him to use as makeshift weapons. Ellen, ever resourceful despite the inexplicable dread that gripped us all, collected large rocks from our yard to hurl in its general direction. As if responding to our retaliatory actions, the figure seemingly drifted towards us with an unnerving grace, almost floating above the ground. With every step closer, the guttural humming intensified until it was almost unbearable. 
frenzied by what felt like impending doom. My wife and I joined Mark and Ellen in launching anything we could find at the inexplicable apparition. Stones, branches, even pieces of broken furniture from previous yard endeavors. However, no matter which object struck it or with what force it was thrown with, there seemed to be no effect on that foreboding specter edging nearer. We prepared ourselves for a final stand against this unimaginably terrifying creature or person when we suddenly heard faint sirens approaching. Their arrival momentarily paused our standoff as everyone, even our indomitable adversary, turned in their direction. As the sirens grew louder, signaling the imminent arrival of law enforcement, we tensed our bodies gripping our makeshift weapons for the showdown we knew was inevitable. The moment was frozen in time as Predator and Prey stared each other down, just seconds from engaging in a life-or-death struggle for survival. We couldn't waste another second standing there as the unknown figure steadily approached. Mark and Ellen started throwing rocks again while my wife and I focused on gathering more items from the yard to use as weapons. The sirens grew louder, but we couldn't rely on them for protection. We had to keep the figure at bay until help arrived. The squad car's lights pierced through the darkness while Mark, Ellen, my wife, and I hurled debris at the figure to repel its inevitable approach. The police officers jumped out of the car with their guns drawn, demanding that we drop our makeshift weapons and refute any notions of attacking the mysterious entity. We dropped our arms and hastily explained to the officers that this threatening presence had drawn all those gruesome body parts together onto our property. I gestured towards the writhing mass of limbs as the police hesitantly neared it for inspection. I glanced back at the eerie figure, anticipating that it would attack either us or the officers at any given moment. However, it just remained motionless, even in spite of our fervent resistance. Just as I was about to warn the officers of this lurking threat, one of them let out a desperate cry. We watched in shock as his partner was dragged by some unseen force into that hideous pile of mangled limbs. The remaining officer fired his weapon repeatedly at our tormentor, but his bullets were futile against this indomitable enemy. The officer wasted no time calling for backup but insisted on ensuring that we made it inside our house safely in case any confrontation with the antagonist occurred before help could arrive. He escorted us back into our home as he kept an eye out for oncoming threats his gun never leaving his side. Once inside, our anxiety was palpable with exhaustion from defending ourselves against this unknown enemy while also knowing that a poor officer suffered a tragic demise on our property. My wife broke down as Mark embraced her, offering whatever comfort he could during this gruesome night. Ellen tried to calm herself, too, but it was evident that the initial surge of fear we experienced was being replaced by shock and desperation. Another squad car soon arrived with sirens blaring, accompanied by an ambulance for the deceased officer. The tall figure disappeared along with the pile of limbs while we secured ourselves indoors. We learned later that our undesirable visitors only crept away once every law enforcement officer remained on full alert at our property. Somehow it knew that it couldn't outmaneuver so many armed individuals and seemed to retreat under the cover of darkness. While search dogs were dispatched in a futile attempt to locate the figure or whatever force was responsible for those revolting actions, one thing remained clear there would be no resolution tonight. Detectives urged us to stay with relatives or in a hotel until more information became available about this unexplainable turn of events. Despite their well-intentioned advice, we couldn't bring ourselves to abandon our home, despite the nightmare that had just unfolded in our backyard. 
Any semblance of safety within our walls had been considerably shaken, but we made no move to flee. Days later, anonymous tips sent to the police department unveiled a group of faceless individuals who used rural neighborhoods as their gruesome playground, disfiguring and slaughtering innocent people before vanishing into obscurity once the authorities came knocking. Their motives remain unclear as they continue to torment new victims with each passing day. The Unseen from George Allen The day I discovered the tooth while cleaning my apartment, I didn't suspect anything supernatural. This happened to me on the 24th of February, 2009. I've been a janitor in an old building for about five years now. It has its quirks and weird noises that keep me on my toes during my late night shifts. My friends often give me a hard time working at night, but it pays well enough and provides time to watch football games without any disturbances. It was an ordinary day, Except for one detail, I found a single tooth on the floor of one of the hallways. Oddly, there was no sign of anyone in distress or spattered blood. I pocketed it and continued my work, shrugging it off as just another strange occurrence. Later that week, I went to visit my brother Tom. He had a knack for antiques and unusual items so surely he'd appreciate the prank value of presenting him with the tooth. How's it going, George? Tom greeted me as he opened the door to his house. I presented him with a small, mysterious box containing the tooth, and boy did he marvel at that thing. Though initially taken aback by its odd nature, Tom couldn't help but chuckle after examining it closely but our laughter soon faded when incidents started occurring throughout our small town. People were beginning to disappear under mysterious circumstances during their nightly errands or late-night jobs. A quiet terror started seeping into our lives. My brother urged me to keep quiet about any connection between the tooth and these disappearances. However, concern for my community, terrified by these abductions, kept reminding me of that uncomfortable discovery at work. As much as I tried dismissing Tom's wild theories regarding this faceless being stalking our streets, each new report made it harder to ignore those possibilities. Then one night while working, I discovered fresh bloodstains trailing down a hallway. Dread finally nodded in my stomach and I couldn't have known how close to the truth Tom was about to become. I followed the blood path to the building's basement stairwell, where I found Andy, a fellow co-worker who had arrived earlier for his shift, unconscious on the floor with wounds far too precise and bizarre for any human attacker. Feeling a surge of panic, I carefully picked up my phone to dial emergency services. But the moment the operator answered, I was rendered speechless by an abhorrent sound echoing throughout this otherwise silent area, the low and guttural gurgling of someone choking on their own blood. Desperate, I shouted for help as the line went dead. Minutes crawled by as I waited for aid alone, terrified. However, when backup finally arrived, it wasn't law enforcement, but instead my brother clutching a baseball bat in his hands. He had grabbed it on his way out when he guessed that whatever evil was hunting us might be about to attack again. Together, we stood in that dank basement, searching for any hint of this monstrous entity preying on innocent people while merely going about their lives, never once finding it or any evidence aside from Andy's torn body. The gruesome nature of these attacks only heightened over time. Sliced limbs, gouged eyes, blood-streaked walls filled with agonized scrawls. The terror seeped into every corner of our reality like slithering tendrils. In those terrified weeks, we took to carrying weapons while going about our daily routines. 
There was no denying something sinister was stalking us from shadows we couldn't even see. Though its horrifying handiwork was stark against our world steeped in fear and violence. What if Tom's theory was entirely accurate? And what if holding on to that tooth made me an unwitting target? Droplets of Andy's blood stained my hands as these harrowing questions haunted my waking thoughts. And tonight, another abduction. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, trying to spot the faceless human. I didn't investigate, terrified of what I might find or where it might lead me, but decided that it was better to just focus on staying alive. The tension in our town became palpable as more people disappeared and more gruesome attacks were reported in the news. On the third day after the attack in the basement, a group of us decided to stay together as we walked home from work. We hoped there was safety in numbers, but we still clutched makeshift weapons tightly, knowing the antagonist had evaded us all thus far. As we neared a turn in our path, Sarah screamed and stumbled backward. Blood and dismembered body parts lay strewn across the ground before us. The victim was unrecognizable. A dead silence hung in the air. None of us knew what to do or say. Tears streaming down her face, Sarah kept repeating that she couldn't take it anymore. She grabbed her phone and dialed 911 managing to choke out a desperate plea for help before falling to her knees. The police arrived soon after Sarah's call, but they were as perplexed as we were about who or what was responsible for these heinous acts. Though overwhelmed by fear and grief, we couldn't risk letting these facts slip away from our memories, so we committed to documenting everything taking pictures of the crime scene on our phones before leaving with the assistance of the police officers. A curfew was imposed on the town as survivors huddled together inside their homes. Doors were locked and windows sealed shut in an attempt to keep danger at bay. Our lives had changed drastically under the constant threat of violence from an unknown force. Eventually, a shred of hope emerged among my friends and me when we realized that there might be some pattern to this madness. We began connecting dots drawn between victims and crime scenes based on online reports, while still being confounded about the antagonist's identity. As we sat together one night, going through our findings, a heavy knock sounded at the door. My heart leaped into my throat, and Tom raised his bat prepared for a confrontation. It was a relief to see our neighbor, Samuel, standing on the doorstep drenched in sweat and panting heavily as though he had been running for his life. I found something, Samuel whispered hoarsely, sliding into our living room. Tom locked the door behind him while we listened intently to Samuel's story. He had been going through some old files at the town hall when he stumbled upon chilling accounts of faceless people who had terrorized generations in our town's past. The revelation troubled us even further. Were the faceless humans responsible for all these disappearances and gruesome murders? We decided to keep this information private from others, not wanting to spread more panic among our friends and neighbors and since Samuel didn't find any information on how to stop them, calling for help seemed pointless. During those days barricaded in our home with only each other to speak with, we were forever vigilant of any approaching danger lurking outside, only leaving briefly for supplies. One evening, as I peered out a window crack in paranoia-driven diligence, I saw it, Dimly lit in the street lights, orange glow emerged a faceless human. It reached out for someone passing by, a young woman with groceries clutched close to her chest. Before she could scream or fight back, it grabbed her and vanished into an alleyway. I barely managed to stifle my own scream as fear and dread choked me. My family gathered around me at once as I narrated what I saw. 
The reality that these creatures were very real and active sent chills down our spines as we wondered who could be next. Our town now lives under the ominous shadow of faceless people. And though the anticipation of the next attack never left our minds, there seemed to be no escape from the invisible threat. The streets remained deserted, but even within the confines of our own homes, we were not safe. The Curse of the Faceless Man from Gore 567 I never thought something like this could happen in my sleepy little town. This happened to me on September 12, 2016. My name is Jeff Daniels, a pretty average guy with a pretty mundane life. I work at the local hardware store and live with my cat, Fluffy. My greatest vice has to be my nicotine addiction which has been tough to kick. Recently, I started chatting with a nice woman named Emily who lives on the other side of town. On that fateful day, I left work after what felt like an ordinary shift. Driving through the heart of Oakwood Falls, a small town in Massachusetts where everyone knows one another, I noticed police cars surrounding the old library. Officers were bringing out body bags while a crowd gathered at a distance. The scene was gruesome. As days went by, there seemed to be no progress in solving the chilling crime that had taken place at the usually serene library. Our town was on edge, and I couldn't help but follow any developments in the case. One evening, Emily and I were having dinner at a cozy pizza place downtown. She worked at Oakwood Falls Hospital and told me about unusual wounds found on some victims that had recently come through the ER doors, a strange pattern carved into their flesh. As it turned out, there had been similar cases over the past few weeks. Her description of those injuries weighed heavily on my mind as we said our goodbyes for the night. By the time I arrived home, it was pitch dark outside. Several days later, I encountered a horrifying scene when walking through town. An unconscious man sprawled in the alley next to Joe's bar with blood pouring from his neck onto his shirt collar. He had those same unnerving symbols carved into his skin. I whipped out my phone and dialed 911 with trembling fingers, pleading with them to hurry as I tried my best to keep pressure on the man's wounds. As I looked around, I could almost feel an unseen presence watching me. Weeks passed, with similar incidents terrorizing our community. The atmosphere in Oakwood Falls had changed completely. A sense of dread permeated every corner. Conversations among friends turned speculative and somber as gossip circulated about a potential serial killer in our midst. Emily and I became even more hesitant when venturing out at night alone, often opting to walk together when we could. One particular night, we were walking home from another dinner date when we noticed police activity near her apartment building. A detective approached us, his face pale and grim, asking if we had seen anyone suspicious or unusual in the area recently. We both shook our heads exchanging worried glances. As we continued home under the streetlight's faint glow, Emily clutched my hand tightly. We couldn't help but feel vulnerable and unsettled with each step we took. After talking it over with Emily, I decided to buy a security camera for her apartment. Better safe than sorry seemed like good advice given the circumstances. The next day, she enthusiastically showed me the footage she had captured overnight. To our unnerving surprise, there was a figure lurking right outside her window, tall and faceless, wearing all black clothing. Despite being unable to clearly make out who it was or their intentions, we knew this couldn't be a coincidence anymore. It felt like something much more sinister was at play. 
With each passing day, more and more victims kept turning up across town, all inflicted with those same horrific carvings. Oakwood Falls was starting to feel like nothing more than a cursed town held hostage by evil forces beyond human understanding. People went into hiding, some even packing up their belongings and leaving for safer environments. Stores shut down early while groups of frightened citizens patrolled the streets after sunset, armed with wooden bats and flashlights. One night, as Emily and I were huddled up on her couch, watching the news about another grisly murder, I heard a sound outside the apartment, a loud crash followed by glass shattering. Stricken with fear, we looked at each other in horror. I cautiously approached the window, my heart pounding in my chest and a golf club clenched in my hand. Through the broken glass, I saw within arms reach a ghastly scene like nothing I had ever witnessed before. Blood painted the pavement below. It was clear that once again, the faceless attacker had struck. I grabbed my phone and called 911 again, informing them of the gruesome scene outside Emily's window. We huddled together, fear gripping us as we waited for the police to arrive. The thought of calling for help from friends or neighbors crossed my mind, but in the chaos of the moment, I couldn't think straight. Soon, blue and red flashing lights illuminated the street. Officers quickly entered Emily's apartment, making sure we were safe before examining the scene outside. We provided our statements to the police, answering their questions to the best of our ability. As they continued their investigation, officers went door to door, questioning other residents in Emily's building while collecting any available camera footage. However, due to privacy concerns and a lack of resources, I decided not to share our security camera recordings with everyone in the area. We didn't want anyone panicking or targeting us further. Realizing we wouldn't be able to stay at Emily's apartment, while it was a crime scene, I suggested staying at my place for the night. After making sure the police had our contact information and informing them of our decision, we grabbed a few essentials and left. Once we reached my apartment, we tried our best to calm down, but every little noise made us jump. The situation had become too real for us. Oakwood Falls was no longer a safe haven for either of us. We knew something had to be done. Turning on the news yet again to keep ourselves updated with every development seemed like our only course of action. There was no time for pondering or wishing for a better outcome. We needed to stay informed and prepared for whatever might come next. The news revealed more victims found throughout town with similar markings and injuries. Panic spread among Oakwood Falls residents like wildfire as people began demanding answers from law enforcement. A town meeting was called by local officials to discuss possible actions and ensure community safety. It was agreed upon that until the faceless attacker was either caught or identified. A curfew would be enforced and official neighborhood watch groups would be formed. Days passed as the entire community banded together, sharing information and watching for any suspicious activity. The once peaceful streets of Oakwood Falls became eerily quiet as citizens hurried home before the imposed curfew. Emily's apartment remained off-limits as the investigation continued. We spent our days glued to the news, feeling helpless and trapped. The bizarre incidents raised questions that tore at the fabric of normalcy in our lives. One evening, my phone buzzed with an urgent call from one of the investigating detectives. Based on their analysis of the crime scenes and their proximity to Emily's apartment, they had finally come to a harrowing conclusion. The faceless attacker had struck again brutally killing more victims marked with identical symbols, all living in our neighborhood. 
the detective advised us to double-check every security measure we had in place and remain vigilant until further notice. It seemed that, despite our best efforts, we could not escape the nightmare unfolding around us. While I silently prayed for these heinous crimes to cease, I couldn't shake off the chilling thought. How could such horror manifest itself among ordinary people? To try and protect ourselves further, we decided to invest in more security measures like extra locks and additional cameras. As I added protective measures like checking windows and doors constantly throughout the day, I found myself wondering if this would ever be enough to keep us safe from whatever evil lurked outside. It wasn't until days later, when a vital piece of evidence was discovered, that we began to understand the horrifying truth surrounding Oakwood Falls. The police released a bulletin stating that they had arrested several individuals who had been living in secret among us. Faceless people wearing masks concocted from human flesh who were part of an underground cult committing these atrocities. The final revelation sent a chill down my spine as I realized that the depravity we had witnessed was not the work of some inhuman force but rather our very own neighbors. Individuals who were silently lurking in plain sight, hiding behind faceless masks while they wreaked havoc on our once peaceful community. Bloodied Knuckles from Jordan 934 My life was ordinary, but I liked it that way. This happened to me on January 15, 2007. I was working late in my small office at the local community center in Louisville, Kentucky, that evening. My job focused on organizing events and fundraisers, and it kept me busy most hours of the day. As an only child with parents who had passed away a few years ago, there wasn't much reason for me to rush home. I'd even adopted a French bulldog named Axel though he didn't always fill the vast emptiness I sometimes felt inside. There were others working late with me, Janet, our secretary, who frequently spilled tea on her keyboard, Mike, a middle-aged volunteer who often wore the same plaid shirt, and Laura, the kind-faced manager, juggling her job with raising two young children. We each had our reasons for being there. That night, we decided to split into two cars and drive to the nearby pizzeria for a much-needed break. Laura needed to check on her kids at home first, so she asked if I didn't mind riding with Mike and Janet before she caught up with us later at the pizzeria. We crammed ourselves into Mike's beat-up pickup truck as snowflakes gently descended onto its windshield. The city's glow cast eerie shadows on roads lined with old Victorian houses looming over us like forgotten tombs. As Mike pulled away from the curb, something caught his attention in the rearview mirror. A large figure wearing what appeared to be a mask with no distinguishable facial features. We strained our eyes to assess whether it was just a trick of light or something more sinister. The figure didn't move. It just stood there on the sidewalk. So creepy, Janet muttered under her breath as our eyes stayed fixated on the mysterious specter in silence. Several minutes passed before we arrived at the pizzeria. As we put the figure out of our minds and entered, wiping the snow from our coats, Mike had a strange sense of foreboding, as if the phantom would follow us inside. Our laughter echoed through the dimly lit establishment as we tried to shake off the uneasy atmosphere from earlier. Once Laura finally joined us, bringing a sense of normalcy, we indulged in multiple pizzas topped with every greasy delight imaginable. All seemed well again. It wasn't until our journey back to the community center that our peaceful night took an abrupt turn for the worse. We spotted similar faceless figures in various other locations, 
some closer to us than others, each capped with an eerie stillness that sent chills coursing through me. Ignoring their haunting presence, we pressed on toward our destination in fearful silence. Halfway there, Janet screamed out in panic when she saw one of the figures right outside her window. Before we had time to react, a loud crash shook our car as Mike swerved violently to avoid hitting another one that had appeared directly in front of us. The truck skidded out of control and came to a jolting stop against a lamppost at the side of the road. Breathing heavily, we checked ourselves for injuries and found nothing too severe, just some minor cuts and bruises. Suddenly, a blood-curdling, anguished scream erupted from outside. We rushed out despite our trepidation to find Laura staring wide-eyed at her blood-soaked hand extended toward her car door handle. It had seemingly been ripped off in a grotesquely precise manner. Desperation set in as Mike fumbled with his phone, trying ineffectually to dial for help. The figures now surrounded us entirely, and their numbers seemed to keep swelling by the second. They closed in toward Laura, relentless and silent. And then everything happened at once. I noticed Mike's phone wasn't connecting to the emergency services, and I assumed it was due to the poor reception in the area. Panicked, I told everyone to get back inside the truck and lock the doors, hoping it could buy us some time. Everyone stay calm. Let's try to figure this out together. I said as Mike started the engine. Laura, still shaking from her injury, tried calling for help with her phone. She had more luck than Mike, but their response would take time, too much time. The faceless figures began moving towards our truck with a slow yet purposeful stride. As we sat there, preparing ourselves for the worst, Janet spotted something coming down the street. It was a police car with its lights flashing. We all breathed a temporary sigh of relief. Perhaps they could help us. The officer quickly stepped out of his vehicle and approached us cautiously. We rolled down the windows just enough to be able to communicate with him without risking our safety from the faceless figures lurking nearby. We received a call about an accident in this area, he said urgently. What's going on here? We quickly filled him in on our bizarre encounters with the faceless figures and how they seemed to be stalking us through the streets. He could see them as well and seemed to understand that we were in grave danger. The officer handed us each a small canister of pepper spray, instructing us to use it if necessary. He ordered us to follow his car closely while he led us through back roads attempting to evade any more sudden appearances by these faceless threats. We kept our eyes peeled as we trailed behind his car. For a while, it seemed like we might be outrunning them, until they reappeared. Suddenly, one of the faceless figures appeared directly in front of the police car, causing him to swerve off course. I couldn't believe my eyes, but I knew we had to keep going. As we turned our attention back to the road, another figure appeared directly in front of us. Without time to react, we plowed into it, but instead of inflicting damage, the truck simply glided through it. The figure was unaffected, and our disbelief grew when it simply dissipated into the air. The officer managed to regain control of his vehicle and radioed for backup as we continued our desperate escape. Finally, we reached the safety of the community center. Local law enforcement swarmed the area, gathering statements from us about what transpired. Through their investigation, they discovered that these strange incidents were not isolated. There had been other accounts of faceless figures terrorizing locals for weeks. As news of our story spread throughout the city, Several eyewitnesses came forward with eerily similar stories of encounters with faceless people. 
It wasn't until one brave individual confronted a faceless figure in broad daylight that they uncovered an unsettling truth. The person tore the mask off the faceless figure's head, revealing a man behind it, a man fed up with society's constant need to judge appearances. He revealed that he was part of a group committed to causing fear among those focused on superficial features by adopting threatening and anonymous personas. Though it was undoubtedly an extreme tactic, this revelation shone a light on how preoccupied society had become with physical appearance and image. Our encounter with these faceless people would continue to haunt us as a reminder of humanity's tendency to vilify what we don't understand or recognize as normal.